Hello, hello. Welcome hello. everyone. Hi, hi. A new MSI Insider live stream, but not on a Wednesday as usual, but on a Monday for a very special reason. You can already see it right below me because uh, today we have a very special launch that I know many of you have been waiting for. And you can already see from the person next to me what we're going to do with it. <laughs> so we have Ruth here today. Ruth, welcome. Thank you. The day is finally there. We can uh, demonstrate to you the all new AMD AM5 platform. Um, first, we're going to talk about it as well, give you some more details. And it's not just us doing that. Martijn from AMD will be here to tell you everything about the new AM5 CPU range, about the, different, about the architecture, AM5 platform in general. Um, so a lot of cool, stu cool stuff we're going to talk about. And uh, after that, we're going to benchmark um, games, performance, synthetic performance, uh, power efficiency. So you've got a power meter as well, right, Ruth? Yeah, I do, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, show you a couple of uh, tips and tricks, because Ruth has already been playing around with this platform for a while, and he already yeah. figured some stuff out, how to optimize it. Yeah, uh, so if you're uh, curious uh, to see what you, what you can fill around with AM5, uh, definitely stay tuned. Um, we also have a giveaway today. So we're giving away several codes for Assassin's Creed Valhalla, including the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC. So to participate, go to msi.com slash two slash insider, or our bot will put a direct link to our Gleam giveaway in the chat once every five minutes on Twitch and on YouTube. So if you're watching on those platforms, you can also follow the direct link. Uh, within Gleam, you can perform certain actions, and the more actions you perform, the bigger chance you will have to win. Um, so throughout the stream, we'll give away several codes, um, and the winners will get both a game code and a code for a DLC. So they, they will receive two codes. Uh, let me see. If you have any questions, drop them in chat. Also, if you have any questions for, for Martijn later on, also drop them in chat. Um, I see some questions about RTX 4000. Um, we'll definitely benchmark those, but not today. Today is really about <laughs> the AMD AM5, so the Ryzen 7000 series. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today, going to show you today. Uh, guys, Emil says new AMD motherboards. Yes, definitely. We'll also go through the X670 lineup today. Dushan, welcome, welcome. We're doing well. I hope you are as well. And I hope everyone is excited uh, for today's topic. I know for sure I am. Yeah. So maybe uh, let's go right into it. and. Invite our special guest. So, Martijn, welcome, welcome. Hey, Michiel, hey, Ruud. Thanks for having me. How are you? <laughs> Doing good, thanks. How are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome back. It's, uh, it's very exciting. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a great day, obviously, <laughs> being able to talk to you about the uh, Ryzen 7000 series and all the details. The day has finally come. So, um, yeah, super excited. And uh, again, thanks for having me on this live stream this week. Very, very glad to have you here. So today you're not here physically in our studio, but you're at home because they're yeah. building your kitchen, right? They're uh, placing the kitchen, perfect day <laughs> to do so. Embargo MBA for the kitchen is also at the same time. So, <laughs> so if you hear anything in the background, then it's uh, <laughs> some uh, guys building the kitchen. And stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so AM5. AM5, yeah, super exciting, uh, obviously, for our first time moving to DDR5 and obviously introducing PCIe Gen 5 on this platform as well. But more importantly, world's first desktop processor on 5 nanometer, uh, also featuring Zen 4 architecture. So, so just um, curious, Martijn, why didn't you skip 4 and just named it Zen 5? So everything will be 5. It, <laughs> it would have been perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> agreed. Uh, we have considered this, but uh, obviously our roadmap already was defined some time ago. So Zen 4 it is. Uh, for now. Um, so Zen 4, but, yeah, but 5 of, everything else. Five. <laughs> yeah. 5 nanometer, AM5, PCI Express Gen 5, yeah. DDR5, it's a lot of 5s. It is a 5-star platform, which you'll, uh, I'll show you at the end as well. So, uh, But yeah, you got a good point. But no, nevertheless, super excited, obviously, with Gen 4 uh, making huge drives forward into um, core leadership, architectural leadership for desktop processors for you know gamers, content creators out there. Um, and, you know, uh, for people looking for a new platform, uh, benefiting from all those um, features like PCIe Gen 5 down the road, you know, future proof platform, obviously, um, and DDR5, more memory bandwidth, higher memory frequency, lower latency, and ultimately higher gaming performance. So, yeah, absolutely um, stoked for this platform. Um, so I already mentioned a little bit about our goals, um, ambitious goals for this platform. So not only Zen 4, um, driving the fastest um, core for gamers, uh, the most compute for creators, but also 
leadership core design, um, and obviously driving that next gen enthusiast desktop platform as we talked about. Um, going to the next slide, you'll actually see what we're uh, about to uh, deliver with Zen 4 being at the heart of Ryzen 7000 series. So on the left, you can see Gen over Gen moving from Zen 3 to Zen 4 in the desktop platform. You can see a 13% IPC uplift, that's clock for clock compared to Zen 3. Uh, and then additionally, we've added significant frequency. So this is up to 800 megahertz higher than our previous generation on the 5950X. Uh, we're now up to 5.7 gigahertz for the 7950X. So both of those combined will deliver up to 29% total single core performance gain generation over generation, which is- So 5,000 series know, to 7,000 series. Yes, so this is 5,000 series to 7,000 series, and that's a, a very, very big step forward, obviously, uh, with a generational performance uplift. So, so if people uh, still own an older Ryzen, one of the earlier generations, the uplift will be way higher. Absolutely. So you can just imagine, I believe it's over 200% or something going from, you know, first gen Ryzen to, um, to Ryzen 7000 series. So that's a huge step forward for any gamer out there or content creator or people doing multiple things on their system, right? Because it's all about having high performance cores with Zen 4, obviously having 16 of them with the Ryzen 7000 series, you get so much performance uh, while you can do so many things while you're gaming. So let's say streaming on the side or running multiple applications, recording your game sessions, um, basically, you know, be creative with your content um, or use your PC for different um, productivity tasks as well. So um, multiple, let's say angles, multiple use cases definitely apply to the Ryzen 7000 series. Um, so if we take that 13%, so remember that IPC uplift, if you look at that versus Zen 3 on the next slide, you'll see uh, it's a geo mean. Obviously, it's an average representing the 22 workloads you see basically on the screen. Um, and these workloads include gaming, content creation, and computational benchmarks. So um, as we did the transition from Zen 2 to Zen 3, uh, we felt it was important to show you the holistic view of how desktop workloads respond to the changes we made. Um, and so we're very excited, obviously, to be able to showcase this from Zen 3 to Zen 4 on this chart. Um, but we're also pleased to show you that many of the gaming workloads um, have obviously, um, you know, sometimes uh, often demonstrated disproportionately large gains with Zen 4. So with the IPC increase, but uh, additionally with the added frequency, you'll see um, in some cases, much higher performance increase than that 29%, especially in gaming. So, so and it's something that uh, differs a bit per title, but some titles, yes. they really benefit a lot from this. Yeah, absolutely. If you have that frequency dependent title, um, such as some esports titles, for example, uh, F1 2022 is a good example, but also like Counter-Strike Go, those, those older esports titles, um, you'll see with frequency improvements, you'll see much more performance gains than just the IPC alone. Uh, and just the 29%, uh, that's the geo mean of everything, basically. Uh, in some cases, you'll see up to 35, maybe even 40% performance improvement in a certain game title. So huge numbers, obviously, moving from Zen 3 to Zen 4. Um, and while we did that, we also have, um, you know, uh, our biggest improvement computationally. Uh, we also make a big improvement on power efficiency, which I'll uh, show you on the next one. Because um, if we compare it generation over generation, really, uh, if you compare the same performance, let's say a 5950X to a 7950X, uh, we draw 62% less power than the previous generation on the 5000 series. So while you get that performance, we are 62% more power efficient. Or if you look at performance alone, you get 49% more performance at the same power as the previous generation. So big, big improvements there from Zen 3 to Zen 4. Um, to showcase that a little bit, the next one will show you what it looks like if you run, let's say, the 5950X at full speed against the 7950X in eco mode, so at 65 watts uh, running. You'll see we're still 74% uh, more power efficient, uh, oh, sorry, more performant uh, while we have the same power draw. So 65 watts, 74% uh, more power, uh, more performance. Uh, and if you crank that up a little bit, you get, um, you know, uh, increasing numbers, obviously, on the power efficiency side, uh, while the 5950X also delivers a little bit more performance again. But I think it's just a great uh, showcase of what Zen 4 can do and what uh, that five nanometer um, uh, process node is capable of in terms of power efficiency. As we all know, it's a, it's a very, very current topic in the world, obviously. 
uh, even gamers are looking at it. You know, it's some people worry about their current desktop if they're playing games. Uh, should I buy a new power supply, for example? Um, with this is definitely not the case. We're uh, more power efficient than we ever were. So. Um, so let's talk about the CPUs in question. So we talked about the architecture, we talked about the process node, basically the both combined up to 29% performance gains. And today we're uh, launching with four new CPUs. So at um, the highest end is our 16 core Ryzen 9 7950X with a uh, increased frequency of up to 5.7 gigahertz max boost now. Um, it introduces obviously on all those SKUs as mentioned before by our CEO, during our announcement that all of them will come with Radeon graphics built in. So whether it's the Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7s or Ryzen 9s, all of them will have integrated Radeon graphics. And that's different, of course, compared to the, well, basically any Ryzen so far that ended with an X didn't have internal graphics, but now yes. all of them have it by default. So that's quite a bit. They, they have it all by default. It's part of our IO die basically in the CPU. So, um, you know, any Ryzen 7000 series that we bring to market today, will have it because it's part of that IO die. Um, and the CPU cores are, or the CCDs or CCXs, are merely uh, produced without the integrated graphics. So that helps us obviously in production as well. Um, and it allows us to scale down or up, depending on what you want, uh, with that integrated graphics. Martijn, I think uh, Eric wants to upgrade. I see Eric in the chat, what's the Euro <laughs> pricing? <laughs> Well, I can't comment on the Euro pricing right now, but be sure to check out the reviews because they're coming out today. Um, and obviously it depends on the, the current state of the currency exchange rate, um, which is all over the place, to be honest, on Euro. So it really depends on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're very close to uh, what you see on the US dollar chart, obviously, including VAT and so on, um, depending on your region in Europe, but it's going to be very close to what you see in the charts. I also see Jason is asking about the price for the godlike model. But later, we go into the, the price of all the, the individual models of models. No, I'm interested well. in that as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I talked about the Ryzen 9 7950X, obviously the pinnacle of our stack, uh, up to 5.7 gigahertz, as I mentioned, 16 cores. Then uh, below it, it's this little brother, the Ryzen 9 7900X, uh, 12 core part, up to 5.6 gigahertz. And then the Ryzen 7 7700X, um, 5.4 gigahertz. And then the Ryzen 5 six core part, 7600X at 5.3 gigahertz max boost. So all of those CPUs will boost over 5.3 uh, uh, gigahertz, basically. So the performance uplift this generation really comes from the architecture, the new node, the higher frequencies, but not the core yeah. count. The core count remains the same. Um, and we believe our core count, you know, given the um, performance that we're showing with our high performance uh, Zen cores um, is plenty for the mainstream desktop platform if you need more cores. And obviously we uh, recently also introduced the Ryzen Threadripper 5000 WX series up to 64 cores there. Um, so yeah, we, we see that as a different target audience, obviously. And also for, for example, for gaming, even 16 core is already a bit heading towards productivity because most games, Six scores quite okay. They can use quite a lot of games can utilize six. Some still benefit from six to eight, but that's basically where it ends, right? Yeah, more AAA titles start to make more use of that eight core for sure. So yeah. we see that sweet spot moving up from six to eight cores uh, for a while now. Uh, but as more titles come to market, especially titles like Cyberpunk, etc., which are a bit um, dependent on CPU quality, so the, the architecture, the frequency, um, the IPC basically, but also the core counts there. It matters in certain titles for sure, but as you pointed out... But not all the way up to 64 cores, for example. <laughs> yeah, for example. And, and you rather have a higher IPC and, and higher frequency, what the... For Zen gaming, for sure. cores bring, yeah. uh, than multiple cores, right? In that cer a certain use case, like gaming, for example. So uh, Sweet Spot, obviously, being 16 cores, it's more for those that do content creation on the side or that are streaming on the side or recording their content, uh, to be able to use uh, multiple applications at the same time while they're playing their games at the highest level, for example, um, like the professional streamers. Um, so yeah, we wanted to give everybody basically the best of the best Zen 4 cores that we can bring, whether it's a Ryzen 5 or a Ryzen 9. Sneak peek for the viewers. We will go deeper into the whole streaming story with this platform, but I won't give you too many details on that yet, but in the, in the coming months, you will definitely see more about that. 
Yeah, so, um, and that brings me to another point, a uh, nice segue, by the way, sneak preview into some uh, performance data. And obviously, uh, Ruth and yourself are going to show a little bit more later in the stream as well. Yes. Uh, but yeah, basically closing off that story. And I, I took the Ryzen 9 as an example here on the left. You'll see the generational gaming performance uplift, which is, you know, in some cases up to 35%, as I mentioned. In some other cases, it might be a little bit less, but it depends on you know, what game you're playing and obviously be look be on the lookout for all those reviews that are coming out now uh, from your favorite reviewer, from your favorite press outlet. Uh, be sure to read them because I'm pretty sure they, they'll have so much more details than I can share with you today, uh, deep diving into the platform. Uh, but yeah, you can see a very, very nice generational gaming uplift. Uh, but then on the right side, you can see that generational creative performance uplift. Uh, it's even close to 50%. So that's huge for, um, you know, within the same core count, obviously. So very interesting to see uh, what we can deliver with these CPUs. So because for games, it will CPU. be mostly like the the um, GPU bound titles will not benefit as much as the CPU bound titles. But for content creation, if your program scales well with computing power, it will just scale right on. Absolutely, and that's where the 7950X really sets itself apart from anything out there today, obviously, um, and the Ryzen 9 7900X as well. But yeah. Uh, to the point made earlier, if you're doing multiple applications or games or, you know, uh, things on the side, basically, besides gaming, you really want to look at the Ryzen 7s or 9s, for sure. Um, obviously, we do have the Ryzen 5 uh, as well, nice sleek packaging as well. Uh, these come without a cooler, obviously, um, unless they're foldable, but no, I'm pretty sure these come without a cooler, <laughs> jokes aside. Um, but yeah, with this part, you can get a generational performance uplift, which I'm sure all the reviewers will show you today as well which is going to be very, very big and even surprising some of the higher tiered um, uh, CPUs uh, from the competition, for example, and being able to fight against those. So I see a question from Jason there. in the chat. What kind of CPU cooler would you recommend for a 7950X? Would a standard CPU cooler be enough? Like, what are you looking at? What kind of cooler? Um, so yeah, the coolers are not included in this generation, obviously, because we've also seen that the third party coolers, which are mostly AAO nowadays, you know, liquid coolers, um, really are able to keep the parts cooler than, than we are capable of with our own uh, design air coolers, especially on the Ryzen 9s. Um, so we recommend taking a look at AMD.com. We will have a, a recommended thermal page online as well with cooling recommendations for both Ryzen 7000, Ryzen 9s and the Ryzen 7000 series 105 watt TDP CPUs. Um, so if you need any information, any guidance there, be sure to check out that webpage on amd.com. But with any Ryzen 9 part, even if it's the 5000 series, uh, a 240 millimeter AIO and up is generally what we recommend for that, for sure. It also depends so a bit on what you want to do with it, right? If you want to push it to the maximum, then Absolutely. of course a bigger radiator will help with more cooling. If we're gonna run it stock, then it's a different story. Of yeah, course. I mean, typical power draw for gaming uh, situations could be between 65 watts to 100 watts, for example, for a CPU, right? And when you start utilizing all those cores into rendering and so on, you might see 200 watts being used. And obviously you need a different ballpark cooler there to keep that part cool running 24 seven or longer duration workloads in that types of um, use cases. So it really depends on what you do with the system. But in general, if you're going to 40 millimeter or up, you should be generally okay. Uh, but again, be sure to check out both uh, your favorite cooler brands uh, manufacturer page and product page for your certain Which part. is obviously MSI, right, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got one of those coolers behind me and it's very potent on this generation as well. So I can already confirm that it does work uh, out of the box. It really depends on um, you know compatibility. And it's a nice segue into a story later where we closely work with the ecosystem partners, obviously making sure that this platform is not just about our products, uh, but also making sure that everything out there today is compatible with AM5 and with Ryzen 7000 series, whether it's cooling, DDR5 or storage. Uh, but I'll come to that a little bit later because I uh, wanted to show you the CPU real quick because I showed you the box. <laughs> Jason um, in chat said yes, of course, by the way. In the chat. <laughs> good to hear. Good, one, good, Jason. To hear. good answer. He, he wants to win. <laughs> as well. So I, I hold here the AM4 CPU. Um, 40 by 40. I'm going to okay. make you a little bit bigger in a different scene. Yeah. All right. So I'll try to use my left hand as well to show you the difference between the two CPUs, right? So both 40 by 40 and people often ask why this very, you know, alien like design or octo style design. Um, actually, we wanted to make sure that we can fit. Um, and this is going back to that ecosystem story. 
uh, to make sure that the keep out zones on the motherboards, um, the coolers uh, physically were compatible with the CPUs. So if you look at, um, for example, the socket keep out zones on X670, X670E, or the entire AM5 platform for that matter, uh, you'll find that those coolers will become uh, compatible depending on the brand and the model. So be sure to check that out if you currently have an AM4 cooler. In most cases, you should be able to reuse that same cooler on the AM5 platform within that same segment of uh, CPU. If you're staying with a Ryzen 5, obviously, if you're then buying a Ryzen 7000, for example, the 7600X, uh, you should be able to have compatibility-wise no issues there. But always make sure that the performance is also um, you know, uh, well enough for your cooler to be able to handle that increased uh, TDP, obviously, which is a little bit higher this generation uh, because of that socket design, which is on the slide right now. Um, because for that content creation, as we mentioned, we did want to bring out um, higher, um, uh, you know, performance, more performance in case you really need it. Uh, if you're rendering or doing any productivity uh, workloads, uh, this new LGA socket, so if you mentioned uh, as you showed, um, this new motherboard, obviously, it no longer has pins on the CPU. So the motherboard now holds the pins, basically. And from previous generation, uh, we had, obviously, the pins on the CPU, so PGA. Um, so by going to LGA, we kind of made it more easy on ourselves to allow the socket to draw more power for those use cases that typical workloads that are content creation. And this is also something we already saw on Threadripper, for example. Yes, so that obviously made sense for something specifically designed for those use cases to go that way uh, because you need that power from the socket. Uh, but at the same time, the reason why those uh, CPUs look as they do uh, with the Ryzen 7000 series is we wanted to make sure that the coolers and the holes in the motherboards are aligned with the AM4 platform. So. That way you can use uh, that AM4 cooler, as I mentioned. So not only did it allow us to draw more power, but also make uh, the, the socket compatibility wise move from AM4 to AM5, um, you know, seamless for most users. So um, obviously we talked about longevity, DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5 support for performance growth. Um, whether you're looking for more memory bandwidth today with DDR5 or next generation storage devices, which we'll talk to a little bit uh, later as well, um, you'll have a very much future-proof platform with the Socket AM5 platform. There's some questions in chat. Nido is asking how uh, 7700X would compare to other CPUs. Today we're benchmarking the 7950X, uh, but today you will also see uh, a lot of media reviews popping up, so make sure to check them out to, to get a broader understanding of that as well. Um, I see Nido is also asking, will the CPU have bending issues? No, and not as far as we're aware of. I mean, uh, we've done extreme overclocking. Actually, we've just released world records over the weekend uh, showing some extreme overclocking, which obviously has a very, very high uh, mounting pressure on the CPU to be able to, um, you know, break those world records to have perfect contact with the pot, etc. cetera. Uh, so no, I think um, strength-wise, you will find it's very similar to the AM4 CPUs. But good question, very valid question. Um, so I think moving to the socket on the next uh, slide, we can see that we're launching AM5 with two um, high-end uh, motherboard uh, chipsets first. So X670 Extreme, which is different than the previous generation, uh, but the X series will come with two uh, motherboard chipsets, uh, the X670 Extreme and the regular X670 models uh, that are launching tomorrow actually on shelf. Um, and so what we've done there is uh, with the X-Series boards, which will be available as from tomorrow, as I mentioned, are built uh, to be uncompromising. So whether it's the Extreme with the highest power delivery, um, any X670 should be able to overclock, for example, they're all unlocked, all the CPUs are unlocked, uh, but they come with various uh, flavors, which I'll talk to in a little bit uh, in terms of what to support on PCIe Gen 5. Uh, but all of them support PCIe Gen 5 storage. That's very important for you know a future proof platform, obviously. Um, and then later in October, we will launch two B-series chipsets, the B650 Extreme and the B650. So if you move on to the next slide, you can see the actual differences between uh, the chipsets. Um, so all of them will support PCIe Gen 5 uh, storage, uh, except B650, that depends on what the motherboard manufacturer does with that. Um, and then most of the chipsets will support PCIe 5 on graphics. So X670 Extreme, X670 and B650 all support 
uh, sorry, B650 Extreme all support PCIe Gen 5, uh, 16 lanes, so very important, the full PCIe Gen 5 experience for next generation graphics cards or the generation after that, depends on uh, when those launches, obviously. Um, but yeah, a future-proof platform, which was uh, important to us. And also, for example, if you have two times eight PCI Express Gen 5, that is basically the same as you would have two times times 16 uh, PCI exactly. Express Gen it's, 4 in terms of bandwidth. It's uh, double the bandwidth uh, up to, I believe, um, uh, what is it, 32 giga transfer per second uh, per lane, uh, so up to 128 gigabyte per second, if I'm not mistaken, on PCI Gen 5. So. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll double the bandwidth over PCIe Gen 4. So whatever you plug into it, you will always have the fastest um, uh, lanes and the fastest connectivity um, or bandwidth available to you. So um, DDR5, PCIe Gen 5, that's definitely something to look forward to in the future uh, when we talk about fast storage and fast loading of games and applications. Um, so we talked a little bit about ecosystem, and I already mentioned about cooling focus, DDR5 memory focus, PCIe Gen 5 focus. So uh, one thing we also wanted to focus uh, highly on was going to market with the partners, making sure that, that our platform works seamlessly for uh, users. So um, whatever we wanted to do from our own perspective, whether it's the CPU or the socket design or the chipsets, um, anything that we bring to market, we want to make sure that this uh, gets a um, you know, seamless build experience for any end user or system builder out there, uh, ensuring any of the third party favorite brands in the world cooling products, DDR5 memory and SSDs are not only compatible, but also our AM5 platform is able to extract the best of the best performance from those products. So um, yeah, we basically want to give the end users the best of the best out of the box experience uh, when they upgrade to AM5. Uh, uh, Shiba is asking, main question, prices. Well, actually, uh, we already shown them. Let me quickly head back. We have the overview <laughs> here. Yeah. There they are. So that's US dollars. <laughs> obviously, EU pricing will be very close to that in euros, for example. Yeah, later on, um, we'll go more into to motherboard pricing as well. Yeah, and then uh, obviously one of the key features uh, this generation is DDR5, and we wanted to um, you know, really make an impact into the market with AM5, uh, where we are introducing our new feature called AMD Expo. And basically what it does is Expo-enabled DIMMs enables one-click DDR5 overclocking for any Ryzen AM5 build, um, driving up to 11% faster gaming performance and lower latency up to uh, 63 nanoseconds. So uh, clearly a huge step forward for any Ryzen platform or a step over AM4. And we wanted to make it very seamless and easy for anybody to install Expo memory kits uh, and basically do the one-click overclocking beyond the JDAC standard, right, for any memory type. So, Ultron, Ultron is asking in the chat, when are CPUs going to be released? Actually, on sale tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, 3 p.m. So the wait is almost over. <laughs> yeah, the wait is almost <laughs> over. Um, so much like uh, focusing on the ecosystem partners for cooling, for storage, uh, we've closely worked with the top DRAM vendors, um, obviously co-developing AMD Expo as well. Uh, so primary, secondary, and tertiary timings are all updated. We closely work with the motherboard vendors to make sure that everything is well implemented. And we are going to market today, uh, tomorrow actually, uh, with 15 plus AMD Expo supported kits at launch. So launch speeds up to DDR5 6400. I actually have one of the kits here myself. Um, so this is a Trident Z from G-Skill, uh, but we also launch obviously with Corsair and all the other brands uh, with uh, up to 6400 megahertz support um, and uh, low cache latencies as well. So anything uh, driving uh, ultra enthusiast systems, uh, but from any of those favorite brands that you may have for your DRAM brand uh, of choice, you will find them with DDR5 uh, Expo supported kits in the, in the channel tomorrow. Actually, in today's system that we're going to benchmark in, we're also using one of the kits on your slide. So the, the very right okay, one, good. the Kingston one. Yeah. Our friends from Kingston sent a, a kit of uh, Fury Beast RGB DDR5 6000 over. Also Expo compatible. So that's what we do the benchmarks with today. Nice. And so you can also demonstrate a little bit of Expo. Yeah, we'll definitely not, do not that. Saying. <laughs> I see a very good question from Merrick. What's yeah. the minimum uh, recommended uh, RAM speed for these CPUs and motherboards? So obviously DDR5 is available from 4800 speeds, which is not ideal for if you're a gamer, for example. Um, you know, our JDAC standard is 5200, but you can also use 5600. The sweet spot, much like AM4 is today with their 3600 kits and low latency, 
Um, the sweet spot for DDR5 on the Ryzen 7000 series will be DDR5-6000. That's what we recommend if you're a gamer, enthusiast, um, content creator, uh, and there are plenty of kits available uh, supporting 6000, obviously. The reason why this is, is also because our Infinity Fabric will run one-to-one -one ratio, which is the most ideal, uh, and you'll get the highest performance and lowest latency at the same time. I see a question from Luca. What happens if we don't use Expo DDR4, DDR5? Is there a limit and or do we need manual? No, that's, that's the cool thing about Expo. I mean, it's an open standard, basically. So we made it available uh, open specification-wise and, and OC settings-wise that you know anybody can implement it. But we also made sure that non-Expo memory DIMMs will work flawlessly on our platform. Also, as always, with any memory kit, be sure to check the motherboard's QVL list, making sure that it's compatible and tested by the motherboard manufacturer and support it. Uh, but yeah, we made sure that we uh, support any kind of memory overclocking uh, standard out there, obviously on AM5 uh, or um, non-Expo uh, featured kits as well. Yeah, basically also what we're doing from MSI side is on our wheels head is on AM4, for example, we have the feature called AXMP. So that's on our AMD motherboards. If you have an XMP kit, you can still use the overclocking profile. Um, today, the kit we're using is actually a combo kit, so it has both Expo and XMP profiles. Um, but of course, with AMD, if your memory kit can do Expo, that's probably your best bet because that will be the, the, um, the profile that the memory vendor sets in order to use in combination with AMD processors. Well, it's, it's trialed, right? So it's the fastest uh, performance-wise and it's also for stability the best option, absolutely. Yeah, so you do have definitely have the option um, to use another preset like uh, through a XMP feature on our motherboards. Uh, or manually. Or around. manually, you can indeed set everything <laughs> But yourself. it's a lot of work, uh, trust me from experience, it's yeah. a lot of work to get memory <laughs> running stable and high performing uh, with all those uh, secondary timings. Yeah, there is, there is a lot you can, you can adjust yes. in terms of memory timings and stuff. And, and it's, it takes Expo, one click and you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I see another question. Yeah, Aeroblast uh, is asking. Gigabytes. So, is four times sixteen gigabytes of six six thousand megahertz uh, RAM will it work altogether? Because in the past, those were giving problems. XMP resulted in decreased RAM speed. Well, in general, if you're using four DIM, um, you will always get lower frequencies. Uh, so. Um, I'm not sure what is it defined at from, from AMD side. Yeah, it side. depends on if it's two DIMMs per channel and so on. Yeah. Right? So be sure to check your motherboard, motherboard manufacturer's QVL list there as well and supported RAM guide. It's usually in the manual described there as well. Or uh, on the product pages, you should be able to find more information there as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it generally, because of the number of lanes or the bandwidth that you're using, um, it will drive a little bit lower uh, frequency-wise compared to having two in dual channel. Yeah, so it also depends a bit on your use case, what will be the best option. Like if you're, for example, running a 16 core and doing a lot of rendering work and stuff like that, that is maybe very memory hungry, then lower frequency, more capacity would be your best bet. But if you're gaming and certain games can, for example, respond quite well to faster memory, then you may be better off with only two dims, maybe less capacity, but higher frequency. So it really depends uh, on your specific situation what will be the best choice there? Yeah, you don't need four dims if you're gaming, for example. No. You really want to have two dims out there with the highest frequency possible and the lowest uh, latencies. Um, so that's where you reward yourself basically with higher frame rates because of the fact that you not only have a um, perfectly stable system, but also the fact that you have higher frequencies and ultimately driving more performance and more FPS. So. Uh, Merrick is also asking, will the list of Expo kits will be expanded in the future? Absolutely, good question. So we are obviously ongoing with the DRAM vendors. Uh, any kits that are out there um, or future uh, launches for them, we will make sure that we stay uh, closely working with them and uh, be able to support more Expo coming out um, from any of the DRAM vendors over time. Same with coolers, right? If there are new coolers coming out, uh, obviously we closely work with all of the major vendors. Uh, we ask them if they want to make an AM5 compatible version or uh, what they need to be able to make it AM5 compatible, for example. But as mentioned, 95% plus of the third-party coolers out there are already compatible, moving from AM4 to AM5. Uh, but in some cases, you will need retention kits or a bracket, which uh, I'm sure one, you know, uh, most of the um, third-party vendors uh, will be able to supply you with. Whether it's free or charge or not, that depends on the memory vendor. Uh, sorry, on the cooling vendor. From MSI side, actually, all uh, MSI all-in-one liquid coolers are already compatible with AM5, so you should be good to go already with uh, 
the equipment that comes in a box that you've also been using for AM4, for example. Perfect. Yeah, um, absolutely. Ross is asking Fine. about the future of Radeon graphics. Will it be released with PCI Express Gen 5 or Gen 4? I'm not sure if we can comment on with, that. <laughs> it will come tomorrow with PCIe Gen 6. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no idea, to be honest. I'm uh, solely responsible for desktop CPU side, so I cannot answer any questions on the Radeon side of things, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Talking about PCI Express Gen 5, because, yeah, we can talk about graphics, but with the previous um, step to PCI Express Gen 4, we saw that graphics was not really the, the area that benefited most from the PCI Express generational leap, but storage on the other hand. Absolutely, and we're super excited for uh, the PCIe 5 ecosystem, and I think you also recently announced uh, your Spatium PCIe yep. Gen 5 device, right? The M570, so, correct. Okay, yeah. And um, so, yeah, we're uh, excited to see in starting November that um, the majority of the ecosystem partners from the uh, storage side of things will uh, announce their uh, PCIe Gen 5 devices, um, you know, with uh, a lot more performance, up to 77% faster than the previous PCIe Gen 4 SSDs. So if you're uh, into fast loading, um, lots of uh, data transfer, uh, lots of um, applications that run large complex files, or um, you, know, you need that fast access, you really want to look at PCIe Gen 5. Hence why the AM5 platform is such a great, um, a great option for a future proof platform as well, right? Yeah, and this is also where you will see direct benefit because right now, basically the, the Gen 4 SSDs are just maxing out the bandwidth they have through the interface with four lanes. So the only way to grow further is going to PCI Express Gen 5. Yeah, and all lanes. of the six Or more series lanes, indeed, <laughs> but yeah, that's a... Uh... Yeah, and it will be supported from all of the 600 series motherboards, as I mentioned. So it will be supported from the CPU and the motherboards. Um, so you know, no fiddling around with adding cards and so on if you don't need to. If you want to have that M.2 slot, for example, straight on the board, you can simply use that because it's PCIe Gen 5 ready, depending on the board, obviously, which you choose. Yeah, our, we have two boards in our portfolio, an X670, that also come with an adding card. So if you want even more PCI Express Gen 5, then you can uh, use the adding card as well. But the board itself already has PCI 5.0 possibilities for M.2. Yeah. Um, and I think last but not least, obviously, a question we get a lot from the new generation where people are still you know, finding out from reviews what to look at comparison-wise or configuration-wise. some ideal uh, configurations, I pulled this together, some examples of configuration, whether you're a mainstream gamer on the left, a performance gamer in the middle, or an ultra enthusiast gamer you're using you know, 4K, you wanna have the latest, greatest uh, hardware inside. Uh, basically, if you look at Ryzen 5, 7, or 9, um, these are very typical platforms. And I think uh, based on what you just said on what you're about to demonstrate, on the far right, it looks very close to what you have as a setup today, if I'm not mistaken. It's very close to what we have today. So it's 7950X, we have it. We have the X670E godlike for our demo system today. Let me actually pull up the visual in the bottom of the screen. Um, we're using DDR5-6000. Uh, we're using a 32 gigabyte kit. Uh, and we're using the 6950XT as well. Uh, wow. We don't have two SSDs in it. We, right now we have one two terabyte in there. Uh, the M480, this is a Gen 4 one. Uh, and we have a thousand watt PSU. That's plenty, for sure. Yeah, so um, it's, quite, it's quite close to what we're using today, actually. Yeah, the interesting. So, yeah. so it's good to see that obviously we had no knowledge and we didn't speak about this before, but it's good to see that we're uh, close to uh, what we would recommend as an ultra enthusiast setup, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Which is good. Um, and yeah, so basically to wrap things up, we're just super excited. And, and you know, I recommend you all to, to closely look at what Ruth and uh, Michiel are about to do performance wise and to demonstrate. Uh, but also obviously read up on your favorite reviewers and, and the reviews that they do, uh, whether it's YouTubers, um, written press and so on. Um, you know, it's just so much fun reading through all those reviews and I absolutely recommend doing so. Uh, but basically to wrap up, um, our uh, Ryzen 7000 series is the world's first um, desktop processor in five nanometer. Um, and with the Zen 4 core, obviously it's the fastest processor for gaming and content creation, whether you're using a Ryzen 9, 7, or 5. Um, as I mentioned, all our newly announced Ryzen 5, uh, sorry, Ryzen 7000 series models boost over 5 gigahertz plus, um, and our new uh, AM5 platform brings 
the latest technologies for IO and memory with PCIe Gen 5 and DDR5. So um, to close off, last but not least, um, multi-year processor roadmap and support through 2025 plus, right? Is what we talked about. So all of those fives really makes it a five-star platform uh, to go back to your comment earlier made, um, Gil. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, we're super excited for this to, uh, to finally launch and, and be able to show you more about the performance today. It's a pity you're not physically here because otherwise I could give you a high five right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give one on the camera. <laughs> Digital high five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, just super excited and uh, I can't wait to see uh, what kind of performance you're, uh, you're about to show the, the audience today. But um, yeah, wish you guys all the fun. And uh, again, thanks for having me on the show and uh, thanks for, uh, for dialing in, everybody. Yeah, Matan, thank you so much. I see we still have a, a few questions in chat, so let me fire a couple before uh, we close it off. Uh, Ross is asking, will the AMD 5000 series CPUs still be available after the release of the AMD 7000 CPUs? Very, very good question. And uh, obviously we will have them available. So we understand that the Ryzen 5000 series are obviously still very much sought after products, very high performing as well with a nice price performance ratio in the market. Um, so, and we want to continue supporting that aim for socket as well for people who are still looking to upgrade because we've been supporting that socket for so long uh, for those end users that are still on Ryzen first generation 2000 series or 3000 series. If they're looking for an upgrade, we want to make sure that there's a CPU available for at least the foreseeable future. So uh, definitely one of our focus items is to continue AM4 uh, for uh, at least um, several quarters into 2023. Mr. Teja is asking, does the 7950X has iGPU? Well, not only that one, actually, all of them have. Yes, all of the CPUs have integrated Radeon graphics, RDNA 2. So, um, very much uh, usable for office workloads, uh, multi-monitor setup. It have, even supports encoding, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's not like our typical built-in Radeon graphics products, like our APUs with a G at the end. Those are built for also gaming purposes, for example, if you don't want to build with a dedicated graphics card. These are just simply to turn on the screen. If you're building, let's say, productivity systems where you don't need a dedicated graphics card, you can use the integrated graphics, for example. Yeah, so it's more for display output rather than really doing graphical intensive stuff on it. Absolutely, and you can simply use it as office workloads as well if you're a content creator or productivity and you don't need a dedicated graphics card for sure. It's also very nice for debugging, I think, if you have one. We don't uh, hope uh, you have a lot of debugging to do anyway. And if you, if you have an issue, for example, with your graphics card, it's easier to find out if your CPU has integrated graphics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always interesting and, and it's always nice to have as a backup for sure. Uh, Wraith is asking, can we expect a little price drop on the 5000 series CPUs? I can't comment on pricing, sorry. I mean, uh, we're here to talk about the Ryzen 7000 series today, and obviously those pricing I can talk about, but any future pricing, unfortunately, I simply also don't know, to be honest. So. And Scott is asking, could it be used to encode for streaming whilst gaming on a dedicated GPU? I think you can. I think it has, um, yeah solutions for that built in through our software um, where you can sync up and use video encoding or decoding at the same time with a dedicated graphics card. So, uh, but again, um, it's a very good question and uh, I'm pretty sure the reviewers will uh, definitely touch on that subject as well. So be sure to check that out. <laughs> Ray says, had to try about the pricing. <laughs> <laughs> you always can. Hey, but about pricing, I mean, in general, right? Uh, not just for CPUs or graphics cards and so on. It's, it's almost, uh, we're almost Q4, right? So um, you have your Black Fridays coming up, et cetera, et cetera. So, but yeah, if you want the latest and greatest Ryzen 7000 series is where it's at. Yeah, I think that's why we will wrap it up for today. So Martijn, thank you so much for joining us today. I think you gave a very good insight on the new AM5 platform, the new CPUs you're bringing, of course, tomorrow. Um, we're going to take a closer look at all the motherboards now, and later on, we'll combine them to see what they can do together. You can have the fun part, and uh, thanks again <laughs> for having me on the show. Uh, and thank I'll you so much for joining, time. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks, Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. So, that was Martijn. Always nice to have him in the live stream. I hope you, you guys uh, learned a lot from him because this is still the theory part, but later on we're of course also going into practice because it's always nice to see numbers, but what, what can it do in real life as well? Um,
Before we start, let's uh, do our first giveaway for today. So if you haven't participated yet, go to msi.com slash two slash insider or watch the direct link that our uh, bot should put in the chat on YouTube and Twitch every five minutes. But I saw some people yeah, asking some for it. So I hope for our link, bot works yeah. today. Let me ask Eric if he can check it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then let, let's pick our first winner for today. Uh, so we're giving away um, codes for Assassin's Creed Valhalla, uh, including an additional code for the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC. And our first winner for today, Ruth, the honor is all yours. It's Dude. Dude, congratulations. You won the first game code for today for Assassin's Creed Valhalla including the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC. So if you haven't participated, make sure to do so, because we will do some more drawings uh, throughout the stream for sure. Let me see. Denise says AM4 boards don't support AM5. That's correct. Uh, but they said you wouldn't need to swap boards. I don't know who they is, but if, if you're going Coming from AM4, you definitely need to swap boards to go to AM5. The socket is completely different physically, but also the platform is very different. So AM4 is also fully based on DDR4 memory, whereas AM5 is completely based on DDR5 memory. So there are also no DDR4 versions on AM5. Uh, Luca is asking your boards release tomorrow at the same time. Yes, boards release together with uh, the AM5 processors. Uh, Wraith says new CPU uh, means new motherboard, basically. Yes, right now it does. Of course, we had AM4 for a very long time. Um, so all the way from the Ryzen 1000 series up to the 5000 series it was interchangeable um, on AM4 motherboards. Um, but right now, it's a completely different plat platform, new socket, physically different. So yes, it needs a new motherboard. Yep. Uh, Kuma asking, can we use DDR4 on AM5? No, you cannot. It's really DDR5 only on AM5. There is no combination motherboard or no, there is no DDR4 model of the motherboards either. No. So really AM5 by default means DDR5. Also, we, it's not that we, we can make one of these models because the memory controller is located in the CPU and these new 7000 series processors, they only have a DDR5 memory controller built in. So we, we also, we cannot make a motherboard with DDR4 um, on AM5. Um, UH60 driver is asking, anyone found DDR5 memory with Expo? I've only seen it listed with XMP. Actually, some kits, for example, the kit we're using today is also a combination kit. So it has two, I believe it has two Expo profiles and two XMP profiles, yep. right? Correct. Yeah. Um, so there are also some dedicated Expo kits. Um, availability um, will differ also per region, but there should, the first kit should be, should be out there. Uh, Nido is asking, are you going to test the iGPU? No, not today. Uh, like Matijn also mentioned, it's not really an iGPU meant for graphically intense tasks. I wasn't uh, able to uh, test the iGPU for two reasons. One, I have the Godlike motherboard, which doesn't have any outputs for graphics. And two, I don't have the driver, so... I think actually, uh, doesn't probably the Godlike... Probably the driver is now available, but when I was testing it, uh, I didn't have anything. I think the Godlike can do DisplayPort over USB Type-C. Oh, really? I think it can. But I, I didn't see the iGPU listed or it's disabled because I put a graphics card in it. That could be. I'm not 100% sure On about On Intel, that. we don't do that anymore. So we leave the, the integrated graphics enabled even though you install a discrete GPU. So yeah, for example, if you want to do our tests yeah. on the iGPU, but, like quick but sync. with this godlike, yeah. it, it didn't show up, so I thought it was not. Yeah, we we'll have to look that up. I'm not 100. Like, like we did sure. with the old uh, godlikes, we, we disabled that part, so we had more phases for the CPU instead of yeah, the yeah. integrated one. Dushan's asking, do you guys have a new favorite motherboard within the AM5 platform? Yeah, godlike because that's the only one I tested so far. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have another one, but I cannot comment on that one yet. <laughs> that will be a topic for another live stream. But I definitely have my new favorite motherboard for the AM5 platform. It will come uh, later, right? It will come later. Yeah, I think it's on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> but it knows the one I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, let's first take a look at our motherboards as well. Of course, we have the, the CPU story now, um, but we also have our motherboards. So let me head back yeah, right here. It, uh, 
Arizona's oh. asking, was the dashboard touchscreen improved from the Z690 version? Yes, it is, yes. Yeah, we'll also go into yeah. that. We don't have a detailed uh, demonstration of the, of the dashboard, but yeah. Yeah, it has improved. It's working out of the box, and if you want more advanced features, you need to install MSI Center, which I didn't do today. I focus mostly on the CPU part and uh, the performance and the power and the cooling. Merrick says, knowing him, must be a micro ATX motherboard. No, Merrick, micro ATX is way too big for me. You know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think people can already guess what is still to come. <laughs> but let's first take a look at our X670 motherboards. Um, so we're launching four models. Um, in the MEG, the enthusiast segments are the really high-end segment. We have the MEG X670E Godlike and the MEG X670E Ace. Um, then within MPG, so performance gaming, we have MPG X670E Carbon Wi-Fi. So all these three models are X670E, meaning they offer P PCI Express both on M.2 and on Time16 slot, so also for graphics card. Then within our Pro segment, we have the Pro X670-P Wi-Fi, and that one is not an X670E model, meaning this one only offers PCI Express Gen 5 on the M.2 storage, but not on the Time16 graphics slot, uh, uh, PCI Express slot for a graphics card. Um, when comparing this to basically previous uh, high-end generation AMD, so X670 uh, or X570S, um, we can see a lot of differences. Of course, this is a new platform, so moving from PCI Express Gen 4 uh, and DDR4 to PCI Express Gen 5 and DDR5. Uh, of course, there's also still uh, PCI Express Gen 4 slots on the motherboard. There is there's some PCI Express Gen 5 lanes, but not everything on the motherboard will be PCI Express Gen 5. And that, of course, also matters whether you're using X670 or X670E. The power design got quite a big upgrade, and this is even X570S, so that was already the upgraded version of X570. Um, actually, if we're, for example, comparing our most high-end motherboard from the first generation X570, so the non-S version, the ones that still had the fan on the chipset, the VRM on our most entry-level X670 board, so the Pro, is actually stronger than the VRM on the godlike on X570. So we had uh, 14 phases, 70 amps on the X570 Godlike, and we have 14 um, smart power stages, 80 amps on the uh, Pro X670-P Wi-Fi. So just to give you a bit of an indication of how much the VRM has improved over time, because right now it's, I think it's a little over, let me see, three years ago when X570 launched, it was 2019, I believe. July. Um, so yeah, especially in the VRM department, we can see big steps big from steps, yeah. yeah X570 to uh, X670. Our power has increased uh, with yeah. stocks, the stock speeds as well. So yeah, yeah, also the TDP, we already saw that, yeah. for example, the, the TDP of the uh, previous generation 5000 series was up to 105 uh, watts. It uh, doesn't mean that it can't go beyond, but the TDP was right at 105 watts, and now it's 170 watts for the for the Ryzen 9 models, for example. Yeah, but it, it's because they are using the TDP powers, right? So, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll explain a little bit more. Yeah, we'll go later. deeper into power consumption and also what you, how you can fiddle around with this. Uh, uh, how to translate from TDP power to real power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, PCB has also got a tremendous upgrade, and this very much has to do with um, the signal quality that you need in order to properly drive DDR5 and PCI Express Gen 5. So um, it was up to six layers on X670 or X570S, and on X670 it's up to 10 layers even. Um, but even the Pro model, for example, so the, the most affordable X670 model in line, our lineup already has eight layers, so more than the top model in the, the previous generation. Thermal design also has to do a lot with the uh, VRM upgrade, also the thermal design got an, uh, an upgrade. Uh, for example, the Godlike that we're using has a wavy fin design and a cross heat pipe, so two heat pipes in there actually. Um, connectivity uh, also got an uplift. Um, so we ha now have, for example, USB uh, Type C, 20 gigabits per second, but also offering power delivery, um, meaning that you can actually charge, for example, a notebook or a tablet or whatever supports power delivery uh, through the front USB on your case. And that's, that's a, sp uh, a feature specifically for the MEG models, for example. Then 
let's go a little bit deeper into that cooling. So this is the Godlike. This is also the model we'll be using today. Yeah, um, so this one. Yeah, so you see a um, uh, fin array heatsink design uh, with wavy fins. Uh, so let me, let's see, maybe we can use your close-up camera. I think that will be the best way to show it. So I'm quickly going to reconnect. Let me check if yes. I... Uh, yeah, it's already there. Okay. Good, good. Oh, hello, frame rate. Yeah. So you see the stack. Um, yeah, this is the fin array. I'm not sure. And that's of course to increase surface there. area, and there you see and the wavy like fin design as well. Focusing. No, I think I down. have a focus button as well. That worked. Oh, auto focus. Yeah. The Door open. No, okay. Frame rate's not great. Always with close up cam, but I think. Uh, you get what it is. Okay. Um, another thing that's inside, so that's hard to show right now, but there are actually two heat pipes in there, the cross heat pipes, and in the back plate, it's not only the big back plate on the back. So may maybe can you show the ACE in the close up cam? Yeah. Um, the back of the ACE to be specific. So you see there is a big back plate right here, but there is actually a separate small backplate underneath it to help to cool uh, the MOSFETs from the rear side as well. I'm not sure if I can show you. Yeah, it's maybe it's a bit in hard between. to see on the... oh. So if we head back to the um, to the slide where you see the exploded view, you see that there is a separate backplate behind the VRM that also helps yeah. to cool the VRM. Then on our other models, uh, so this is for example the Pro, we have the extended heatsink design meaning that the, the heatsink of the VRM will stretch all the way over the I.O. also to increase surface area. You also have the Pro, right? I also have the Pro, yeah. Is this one? Yeah. And if you look at it, you can see that it extends oh, over the I.O. ports. You can look through it a little bit. But it's quite huge. It's also quite heavy uh, because of there's a lot of uh, aluminum uh, attached to it. Kay. And this is something that you will, for example, also find on, on the carbon uh, model. Yeah. Then Ender 2 Shield Frozer. Um, this is actually available on, on all models that we have. Um, and this helps to cool and protect the SSDs. And especially now we're heading to uh, PCI Express Gen 5. It is expected that power consumption uh, will increase also with the faster, newer SSD controllers. Um, so to prevent thermal throttling and to, to maintain uh, high transfer speeds, um, make sure to use the M.2 uh, Shield Frozer uh, on your motherboard as well. On the PCI Express Gen 5 slots and on uh, Ace and Godlike actually on all slots, there is also double-sided Ender 2 Shield Frozer, meaning there is not only a uh, heatsink on top, but also below the Ender 2 SSD. So many modern Ender 2 SSDs have memory chips on either side of the SSD, and this will help to cool the complete uh, SSD, both the top and the bottom. So here you see an overview of the power designs of the different bottles in our X670 lineup, and in the image you see our uh, MEG X670E Godlike. That one actually has 24 um, phases for the V-core, so specifically for the CPU, and all of them are 105 amp rated, so it's an extremely strong VRM design, and this is way beyond what, what we, for example, had for X570, so big upgrade here. Um, and as I mentioned, X670-P, so the most entry-level X670 model, I know it's, it's a bit hard to call X670 entry-level because it's the high-end chipset already, um, but that one has 14 phases, 80 amps. So that one is actually more powerful than last generation's Godlike, just to give you an indication of how strong this VRM design is. On our MEG boards, we also have the OC engine, and this uh, allows you to also do base clock overclocking on the CPU. This is not on the Carbon and the Pro, uh, but both the Ace and the Godlike have this feature. Then memory boost. Um, with um, X670 motherboards, depending on the model, uh, you can go up to 6,666 megahertz. Uh, of course, this is based um, on two modules. If you're using four modules, you won't be able to, to reach this high, just to get that out of the way. This is really, if, if you use four modules, um, you will, of course, have more uh, possibilities in terms of capacity, um, but your frequency will be lower. 
because you will put more yeah. strain on the memory controller. Um, so keep that keep that in mind. And also and depends on the motherboard. Eh? Yeah, it also depends yeah. on the motherboard. Sa same goes for the Intel platform, by the way. Yeah. But uh, I've tested with four modules, uh, four times 16, and then uh, single rank modules are these, uh, the ones I'm using. And I could run uh, 6000 uh, C36 and C40, because I have two kits. One is uh, C36 and the other one is C40. And so the, the common uh, speed would be 6000 uh, C40. Uh, but that wasn't stable. But if you go back to the, the Profile 2, which is the 5600 C40, uh, that was stable with four modules. And I had the same with the Intel platform. So uh, I think it depends on the motherboard, depends on the modules, also depends on the bias, because I've tested already this motherboard already with three different biases because biases are coming out I think every three days or so. So there's a lot of uh, fine tuning going on in our headquarters. Uh, there's a whole team working on the memory uh, compatibility and hopefully that will improve uh, uh, with uh, more mature biases. Um, I see Marika a question about the uh, USB Type-C with power delivery. Actually we'll go in, I have a separate slide about this to give you more of an idea of how this, this works exactly. Um, let me see some more questions. Will MSI do another even Gillium motherboard case, etc., for AM5? Not sure yet. Maybe could be in the future. Um, yeah. Will the Pro have a integrated I/O shield or not? No. Yeah. No. No. no it looks. It doesn't look like it. No. No. It's a separate I/O shield. The okay. other ones uh, have integrated ones. Um, let me see. Chrome is asking, um, can the NVMe slots be used in RAID modes? Yeah. Yeah, they can. So you have several RAID options there. So for example, if you want to have even faster storage, you want to, for example, use uh, RAID 0, so then you can yeah. um, basically double the bandwidth for both SSDs. Yeah. I haven't tried RAID on the AMD platform, though. So, yeah, you could do software RAID anyway, but yeah. m maybe that's even preferred. UH60 drivers asking, was CL36 stable at 6000 with four sticks? We actually don't have uh, no. two identical kits with the CL36. No. Uh, and 6000 C40 was not stable with four sticks, but 5600 with C40 was yeah. stable. So uh, I used the, the, the second profile, so the Expo profile or the XMP profile. Uh, uh, that was stable with uh, four sticks, so that was no problem. So yes, with, with four sticks you might need to drop a speed grade. Uh, so in this in this particular case you need to go from 6000 to, to 5600. Um, another thing with DDR5, and this is also something we saw on, on uh, Intel with the, uh, the 12th gen and the 600 series motherboards, is SMT soldering on the memory slots. So maybe you can show the back of a, of a motherboard too? Yeah, and it has a back plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe go for carbon or something. <laughs> yeah, or the, the, or the Pro. Pro. Yeah. 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 So as you so can see, you don't no see pins. the very sharp pins on the back of the motherboard anymore that you no. would see on the DDR4 bo uh, board, because that's because of the uh, SMT soldering. Um, and this is also something that you will see for um, the PCI Express slot if it's Gen 5. It's also SMT soldered. I think this one is a Gen 4 slot. No, this is also an old But also one. SMT soldered? Yeah. Okay, interesting, because that's on Intel, well, it's only on the, on the Gen 5 one. Okay. So SMT soldering, for example, helps with the signal quality. That's why you will see that on PCI Express Gen 5 and DDR5, for example. Yeah, eight layers. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Then let's go into uh, the Expo story a bit. Martijn already touched on this. Um, our boards, of course, support this new um, AMD Expo feature. So Expo stands for Extended Profiles for Overclocking. Um, and as I also mentioned before, we still do support AXMP. So that's basically XMP on an AMD motherboard. So if you also already have an, a DDR5 memory kit that, for example, supports XMP, it is no problem. You can still use it with um, our X670 motherboards. Uh, you can also still select those specific profiles through the AXMP uh, function. Um, another thing important to mention is that there will be XMP only kits, there will be Expo only kits, but there are also combo kits. So the kit that we're using today is actually a combination and 
the kit that we're using right now has two XMP profiles and two Expo profiles. Yeah, I also tried the Expo on the Z690 motherboard and that worked fine. Yeah. yeah. So these are the, the modules that we're using today. So they're the Kingston Fury Beast modules with RGB memory. Here yeah. you already see a couple of the speeds that are available in terms of the Expo and, and the timings they have. We're actually using the one on the very bottom. So the 32 gigabytes kit um, at 6,000 megatransfers per second CL36. Um, so this is just a one-click setting. So yeah. you select the Expo profile and it will automatically load the setting with the right voltage, with the right frequency, and with the right timings. So it's, it's very easy. It's one click in the BIOS and you're good to go, basically. Yeah. Um, Arizona is asking, is uh, Precision Boost Overdrive still a thing? And does it work the same way it does with Ryzen 5000? Uh, it still exists. The only problem is you don't get much out of it. Uh, there was much more room in AM4 than there is in AM5, or at least in uh, Vermeer, uh, the 5000 series had some boost going on. Um, uh, I, I think only for, for manual overclocking there's something to, to be gained there, but not with uh, your typical uh, stock cooler. So you probably need like uh, a phase changer or LN2 or other kinds of uh, cooling to go further than the performance you already get from stock speeds. So if you want to extract more performance out of it, you need to go extreme overclocking uh, style. So with manual overclocking, you cannot get that much because the power and performance is already tuned to get the maximum out of it. So uh, it's see a well done by AMD. I see a question from Dushan. Will Expo and Intel XMP 3.0 uh, will be showcased on the product's box? Was it on the, um, the Kingston box that you had for the... I think it is on yeah, the... Yeah, there should be two logos on it, yeah. Yeah, I, thi I think it does show. So but I think I this forgot one to bring the, the package. Yeah, but package. I think it did show the Expo logo and the XMP logo because this is a combo kit. But I also expect that an Expo only kit will show the Expo logo only. And yeah, normally I have the packing here, yeah. but I forgot um, it this time. Let me see. Merrick's asking, is the Expo profile not on by default? No, it's, it's basically like, for example, you know, from Intel XMP. Um, so by default, uh, you will just get the JDAC, JDAC frequency. Yeah. So I think this one will run at 4800 megahertz, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, and the Expo profile is something you have to select yourself. Uh, but it's one yeah. click, and the rest of the settings will be loaded in automatically. But it is something you have to switch on yourself. Um, Luca is asking, will we see worse performance if we go too much over 6,000 megahertz? Not sure. <laughs> yeah, that's something we still have to test, actually. Uh, also, 6,000 is, at the moment, the fastest kit that we have yeah. um, in-house right now. Um, but as Matai mentioned, with the Infinity Fabric, um, you will not, will, be, will not be able to run this one-to-one. Uh, -one. So probably latency will increase a bit, I would, I would say. Uh, I, I, I don't think he mean, means fabric clock, but what, what we saw was the fabric clock is, is uh, normally at uh, 2000 megahertz, and you cannot really go uh, well beyond that. I haven't tried it much myself, but uh, I have some information from our in-house uh, overclocker top PC, and he said, well, the maximum you can go is about 2166. So that's not a big step up from stock speed. So uh, the only thing you can uh, uh, change is the, the, the U-clock and memory clock divider, or uh, if you run that one to one, is better than if you uh, run it one to two. So half the, uh, um, the U-clock is slower than the, the, the same speed as the memory clock. I'll show you in a bias as well. And that doesn't mean much with uh, the bandwidth, but it does lower the latency a bit. So that could help with to get the, the maximum out of it. Um, like Game was asking, will Ryzen 7000 series support AM4? No, as he was also answered in chat already. Um, Social Gamer is saying, right, it's like the XMP where it's not on automatically. Yeah, that's correct. Basically, it functions yeah. in a very similar way that uh, Intel XMP does. So it's it's also you have to, it's one mouse click, and you're good to go. Um, let me see. 
So if game says, uh, it was a good point. I always used uh, 3600 megahertz DDR4 on my Ryzen 5000 SIG for optimal speed. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was indeed a very good balance. Also in terms of price, by the way, 3600 was yeah. quite a sweet spot for uh, Ryzen 5000 series. Okay, let's take a look at the PCB materials. As I already mentioned, for DDR5, PCI Express Gen 5, you, re you need a very good signal quality. Uh, in order to achieve so, the uh, number of layers was increased compared to previous generations. So already the Pro model um, has eight layers, so does the Carmen and Ace, and Godlike is even a 10 layer PCB. All of them are also um, uh, IT170 server grade PCBs, so really high quality PCBs um, in order to, to get the best signal quality out there. They're also equipped with two ounce thickened copper, and that actually also helps, for example, to cool the components on the motherboard. So if you have the power stages, for example, they're not only cooled with the heat sinks on top, but also through the copper inside the PCB. So the PCB will also dissipate some of the heat of the power stages on there. Screwless and the two shield frozer. This is actually uh, quite a recent fe uh, feature um, that we introduced on our motherboards, and this allows you um, to remove the M.2 Shield Frozer heatsink completely without any screws. And because we also have um, the, the easy M.2 clip in there, you can actually install the SSD uh, completely without any screws or tools. So I think Rud can show us a live demonstration of this. I hope I can. <laughs> uh, let me see if this uh, is still stuck. Let me see if we can do it like this. The droid cam is not working? No, it's, okay. it's stuck for some okay. reason. Let's see if I can maneuver it and that you can see it properly and that it focuses a little bit. So there's a, a small uh, button. Let me... Is that clear? So there's a small edge here and if I press it, it will unlock the... the heatsink of the M.2. There's two slots there and two nudges here where you can hopefully put it in. You're in quite a difficult position like this. <laughs> yeah, I'm not in a very natural... Usually if you do this, put your motherboard flat on the surface. It makes so, it quite a lot yeah. easier. But it, yeah, it, it, uh, it slots in like that and you if you press it down then it will just click on it and uh, be uh, attached I also to have it. a short animation to show you. That's probably better with than a mine. Different <laughs> so, so that's where you yeah, press you it. You have to push it, yeah. You lift it upwards. Yeah. Then you can draw it out. Yeah. And you put your SSD in. And with the easy M.2 clip, it's also attached. And then you put the heatsink back on. So with an angle you put it in, and that's how you click it. Yeah. And then it's firmly attached. So that's how it works. So no more losing screws and stuff. So no. Yeah. This is much easier. And also no more fiddling around with the very tiny screws. I always yeah. thought it was quite complicated sometimes. Uh, we swap M.2s quite often, and it's quite yeah. easy with the, uh, the locking mechanism. So that's a good improvement also for us. Also in some of our uh, motherboards you will find RGB lighting in the M.2 Shield Frozer. So our ACE is an example of that. Um, but of course for RGB lighting you also need to have a connector, connection to your motherboard. And to avoid having to fiddle around with small cables when you want to take your M.2 Shield Frozer off, we actually made a magnetic connection that will automatically slot in there once you, um, you attach the M.2 Shield Frozer. So there you see the connector. Not sure if we can focus. Is this uh, this little connector? So you don't have to mess around with cables. Yeah. So if you turn it around, you can see that inside the M.2 Shield Frozer, for example, here the Ace logo is yeah. illuminated. This will uh, illuminate. And By this the way, way you don't have to, to fall out fiddle around with. Either, yeah. So yeah. So you just install the M.2 Shield Frozer like you normally would and it will automatically connect the RGB lighting, basically. A 
Another new function that we introduced is the smart button. So you may already be familiar with the clear CMOS and the um, flash BIOS button on the rear I.O. We actually, on our MEG and MPG uh, X670 boards, we added the smart button. So there's a third button there and you can um, uh, decide yourself what kind of function you want to assign to it. Um, so you can do this in the BIOS and you can do the same thing for the reset button on the front of your case. So you can, for example, use it um, as a reset button, you can use it to switch on or off Mystic Light, you can use it to go into safe boot, you can use it to boost the fans, etc. So you can set this separately for the smart button on the rear I.O. that you will find for Carbon, Ace and Godlike, um, uh, but also for the reset button on the front of your case and that will of course be controlled through the header on your motherboard where you connect the reset button to. Then heading over to our Godlike, we already had a question about this earlier in the stream, the M Vision dashboard, so that one definitely has been upgraded. So it's a 4.5 inch IPS touch display with a small speaker in the back, so I'll show you up close. And you can use this for a lot of different purposes. So you can use it both in portrait mode or landscape mode, so basically vertically or horizontally. Uh, it's connected through USB Type-C. Um, and there is a special port on the motherboard that is also highlighted on the rear I.O. Yep. So you see a white line around it, you can actually see it uh, yeah, this right there. Yeah. That's where you connect it to. And you can, do, you can control a lot about your motherboard here, you can read a lot of diagnostic information. You can also, for example, if you're using the flash BIOS button, you can see uh, status information of the update process on this screen. Yeah. Um, also the postcodes and stuff. Yeah, postcodes, you can all do those kind of things. Yeah. Um, you can also put your own logo in there, your own video, whatever you like, if you have a GIF file. Um, you can reboot your system through this. You can put an alarm. Um, so the speaker is, is on the back and you can... Does it still do the roaring sound? Yeah, it does. When, when you nice. boot it up, it, it's... Yeah, you get the, the <laughs> dragon roaring sound in the, yeah. through the Envision dashboard when you boot your PC. So, if we take a look here, you see an overview of the functions that it has. So you can have system operation, diagnostic information, a lot of tools. You can put the weather in there if you want. You can set separate hotkeys so that you can actually use the hotkeys on the screen, because it's a touch screen, of course, um, to control certain things. So for example, um, contr control music through it or anything which you like. Um, so that's what M Vision dash dashboard does. And this is specifically a feature for Godlike. So this is not on Ace uh, Carbon or Pro, only on Godlike. I think I hit the HDMI cable. Okay. <laughs> then the backplate design, this is specifically something you will find on Ace and Godlike. So there is a big uh, backplate stretching all over the motherboard and there is a specific MOSFET backplate behind the VRM to help to cool the VRM as well. So specifically a feature for Ace and Godlike. Um, Social Gamer is asking, will it have an option to auto-overclock the CPU? Not really, no. Or, yeah, very much the same as PBO did on AM4. It also depends a bit on, on what you define overclocking or not. Like nowadays, yeah. CPUs already boost quite a lot. Um, yeah. In the past, manual overclocking was much more a thing, but now with the boosting, basically CPUs are a lot better at extracting their maximum performance yeah. already. Uh, may maybe the lower lower SKUs are are able to extract more performance with PBO. I'm not sure. But yeah, maybe they have more headroom indeed. Yeah, but the, the 7950X is yeah is all already at its ceiling. So if you give it more power through uh, Precision Boost Overdrive, it doesn't really boost that much higher anymore because it's already reaching its maximum clock. So. AMD already did a very good job of extracting the maximum performance out of this, uh, this type of silicon. Um, Schnips is asking, can it be connected to existing motherboards or does it only work with the new X670 motherboards? You actually need a special USB port uh, on your motherboard. So that's the one you see with the white outline. So that's specifically a, a feature for God. Like you need that specific USB port in order to use the Envision dashboard. Then if you have an X670E motherboard, you also get Lightning Gen 5 support, meaning that you also get PCI Express Gen 5 on the PCI Express uh, Time 16 slots. Um, of course, you are limited in lanes, so if you want to use multiple um, uh, PCI Express Gen 5 adding cards, it will split the lanes. So you will, for example, use eight, eight lanes instead of 
16.0. Uh, um, but eight lanes of PCI Express Gen 5 will give you the same bandwidth as 16 lanes of PCI Express Gen 4. Uh, so a lot of bandwidth also through the PCI Express slots. And this is also where you see the SMT soldering, so you don't see any pins on the, on the back of the PCB. For the M.2, um, right now all SSDs basically on the market are 22 millimeters in width. Um, we already prepared some boards to support uh, 25 millimeters in width for M.2 SSDs. Uh, I don't think they will come very soon, uh, but in case they arrive in the future, uh, our boards are already compatible with this. Um, so here you see highlighted on the image which slots can already support um, the, the 2580, so that's 25 millimeters in width and 80 millimeters in length, or 25, 110, so 25 millimeters in width and 110 in, um, in length. Um, and it very much depends on the slot whether or not it supports it. Uh, but as you can see, on the higher app model boards, the, the majority of the M.2 slots can support the 25 millimeters in width uh, for the future. Then we have our adding card, and this one comes with Ace and Godlike. It's an M.2 uh, Expander Z Gen 5 Dual adding card. And we actually have one on hand. Right, there it is. And this will give you two additional M.2 Gen 5 slots. Um, of course, it will take these lanes away from your GPU, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but if you really want as much as possible um, very fast storage, then this could be definitely worth it. So the Ace and Godlike already have four M.2 slots on the board itself, and you can expand that to six slots in total using the adding card. So this one gives you two additional M.2 Gen 5 slots. You also see some dip switches there, so that one you can, for example, use to, to switch the fan on and off. We'll see how the dip switch do. Uh, the other one is doing the LEDs. Ah, the LEDs. Yeah, okay. but the LEDs can also be controlled through software, uh, uh, and it comes with a cable to attach it to the motherboard. So there's a JSMB1 connector here, and you attach it to the JSMB1 connector to the motherboard. Uh, that will help uh, control or, or let the software control the fan, so the fan speeds according to the temperature or uh, profiles you set in the sof software, and also for the Mystic Light to control uh, these LEDs that it will be synced up with the motherboard LEDs or other peripheral LEDs. Yeah, so that's the M.2 Expander Z Gen 5 dual adding card. So this comes with Ace and Godlike. Then, Merrick, your question about power delivery. So power delivery basically allows you to power a more power-hungry device through your motherboard. So, for example, if you, uh, if you wouldn't connect the 6-pin, you would still be able to get 27 watts out of the, the front USB port. If you, however, on the MEG boards, um, so Ace and Godlike, if you connect the 6-pin power connector, you can get up to 60 watts through uh, your front USB Type-C. Your case needs to support this as well, so that's an important thing. So, for example, our MEG Prospect 700R will support this, and that way you can, for example, connect a notebook and charge it through your PC. So that's essentially what it does. And you can indeed also use it for quick charging, all those kind of things. So up to 12 volt at 3 amps, giving you 60 watts in total of power. So that's what the, the power delivery does. All our boards also come with 2.5 gigabit LAN. Uh, apart from the ACE, um, that one only has one LAN port and it's 10 gigabit. Um, and all our boards also come with Wi-Fi 6E connectivity. So compared to Wi-Fi 6, it adds the 6 gigahertz frequency band. Um, so you're good to go in terms of connectivity with the X670 boards. Then as I mentioned already, Ace has a 10 gigabit LAN. Godlike offers both. So Godlike has dual LAN. I'm not sure if we can, yeah, we can see it right here. So right now the 2.5 gigabit LAN is connected and the one right next to it is a 10 gigabit LAN. Yeah. So 10 gigabit is based yeah. on a Quantia chip. We only have one gigabit LAN here, so yeah. no matter which one I choose, it's still one gigabit. Yeah, for our current <laughs> setup, it doesn't matter. But yeah, uh, 10 gigabit on Ace and Godlike, and Godlike has both 10 gigabit and 2.5 gigabit LAN. Then addressable RGB Gen 2 devices are also supported on this platform. Um, so you can do more detailed effects, more detailed controls. Uh, on the right image, you can, for example, also see how you can set if you have a supported device, you can set every individual LED, for example, on, on your LED strip in your case. 
Uh, so it gives you a lot of freedom in terms of uh, ways to control your RGB devices. And where Matain already touched on, um, our motherboards are already compatible with uh, AM4 coolers and all our liquid coolers uh, can already support the AM5 platform as well. So it's using the same mounting mechanism. Um, but also, for example, if you um, already own, here you see the, the RAID Prism uh, cooler, you can also use it uh, using the same clips that you're familiar with from AM4. Yeah, I even use this one for testing. Yeah, it's quite handy because it just you click it on and you're good to go. Yeah. So for some quick testing, it's nice. But yeah, we we'll definitely suggest, especially for the higher end SKUs, make sure to get a decent cooler. Go for a higher end uh, liquid cooler because it will simply give you more performance out of your CPU. Um, Brandon is asking, will MSI have any black micro ATX X670 boards with Wi-Fi? Not at this point. I, I don't know about the future, uh, but at this point, we only have ATX boards in our X670 lineup. That's not saying we won't have any smaller boards for AM5, but more about that later. Then let's quickly go through all the different models in X670 lineup, starting off with the Pro. So it's the Pro X670-P Wi-Fi. Comes with an extended heatsink design, 14 uh, power phases, 80 amps. So that's stronger VRM design than last generation's got like. Lightning Gen 5 support, um, one double-sided M.2 Shield Frozer. That one is on the Gen 5 M.2 slot. It has both 2.5 gigabit LAN and Wi-Fi 6E. Um, and it also supports DisplayPort 1.4 um, over the USB Type-C port. Then we have our MPG X670E Carbon Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, we haven't really shown that one yet. Maybe we can show the Pro we've seen a couple of times, so let's maybe take a, a closer look also at the Carbon. So it also offers the extended heatsink design, so you see it stretches all the way over the I.O. It has 18 power phases, and all of them are 90 amp smart power stages. Yeah, I don't know if it's really visible. But yeah, there you can see all the chokes that are behind the power but stages. This one is also massive. Yeah, it's also quite a heavy board already. Yeah, but uh, everything you see here, the, there's no plastic cover, it's all metal. So yeah. before there was a lot of plastic on it uh, with, with the uh, carbon look on it. And now it's just all metal, all aluminum, I would say. And this one, because it's an X670E board, it also offers uh, PCI Express both on M.2 and on um, the Time16 slot. So you can both have PCI Express graphics cards uh, with Gen 5, or when they come out, of course, and um, PCI Express Gen 5 SSDs. It also has... Um, uh, screwless M.2 Shield Frozer on the top slot, you see that, so it's basically the, the system that we demonstrated earlier with the ACE. Um, and it has both 2.5 gigabit LAN and Wi-Fi 6E on the I.O. A lot of USB on there as well, you see the smart button on the left too. And here also you can um, have display port over the USB Type-C port. Yeah, see the smart button is the bottom one. Yeah. I don't know if it's not so readable. No, it doesn't focus, but should say smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually our camera died on us earlier today, so we <laughs> had to sw quickly switch our close-up camera, but it's not as good at f as focusing as our previous camera. It also says uh, uh, USB 10 gig and display port on this display port, oh, on this uh, USB Type-C. Yeah, yeah, that so one indeed supports display port. Even the port. labeling is, uh, yeah. yeah, it's mentioned that. Yeah. I haven't seen that on the no, on the Godlike it says only a USB. Is that maybe it? Maybe it because the VRM of Godlike is so extensive for the V core. Maybe it doesn't have a power yeah, stage for I the figured. IGPU. Yeah. Could yeah. be. Could be. And if you do 20 gigs, then all four lanes of the USB are in use. So yeah. you cannot use two of them for DisplayPort and two for a USB 10 gig. Yeah. So this is the Ace. Yeah. Um, and this is also an X670 E board, so offering PCI Express Gen 5, both on. Um, M.2 and on PCI Express slot, it has 22 um, power stages for phases for the for the. Let me go to the detail cam, specifically for the uh, CPU. And all of them are 90 amp power stages. Um, it has the screwless M.2 Shield Frozer design on the one where uh, Ruth's thumb is on right yep, now. So one. that's the PCI Express Gen 5 slot. 
Um, M.2 should frozen with a magnetic design that we demonstrated earlier, so the yeah, one with the RGB in there. With the RGB in it. Yeah. It has a, two, a 10 gigabit LAN and Wi-Fi 6E. And this one also supports the uh, power delivery over the front. So you see the six pin connector on the bottom of the PCB. The bottom? Yeah, oh, at the right. very bottom you see a six Sorry. pin power connector. Yeah, on the godlike it's on the, uh, on the other edge. Ah, yeah, yeah. So it must be this yeah, one. Yeah, right there. And if you connect that one, um, you will get power delivery up to 60 watts over your front USB type C. One of those? Yeah, one of those. <laughs> Uh, should be the the one closest to the. Actually, I think this six pin is the. Ah, one. I think it's the other one for the. PCI yeah, this Express must be one. for the, the ah, PCI Express yeah, yeah, slots. Yeah. yeah, this says PCIe power. The other one says then, yeah. deep uh, uh, power delivery, PD. Yeah, then power. definitely yeah. connect the one on the side. So this <laughs> this is the one for the uh, for this slot. This yeah, one. if you want to use power delivery. If you don't want yeah. to use power delivery, or if your case doesn't support, of course, you don't have to connect it. No. The same goes, by the way, for the other six pins. So that one is in case you have adding cards that draw more power. You yeah. can get more power to them. Um, if you only use the graphics cards, also, you don't have to connect it. Um, let me see. We we'll have some more questions. See some questions about uh, when to release X670E Unify. Not sure if we will, but if enough people are asking for it, hey, we can always consider. Okay, then let's continue to our godlike, and that one is harder to pick up, Ruth, <laughs> because that's our test bench uh, today. Yeah, yeah, it is. It but here is. I have some more information for you guys. So this is the wavy fin heatsink design with a cross heat pipe. So there are two heat pipes through the heatsink there. It has 24 dedicated phases for um, the CPU. All of them are 105 amp smart power stages. It has PCI Express Gen 5 on both the M.2 slot and on the X16 slot. Screwless M.2 shield frother. Um, this is the one on the, the top right. So you see the big heatsink with Godlike on there. That's uh, the one where you, where you can put the Gen 5 SSD on there. It has two um, LAN controllers, one is a 2.5 gigabit LAN, the other one is a 10 gigabit LAN, as well as um, Wi-Fi 6E. Uh, here also the front USB can support power delivery up to 60 watts, and this one comes not only with the, um, the adding card for the, the two extra Gen 5 uh, and the two slots, but also the M Vision dashboard, the small LCD screen um, that we demonstrated earlier. <coughs> Alvin is asking, what's the difference between Ace and Godlike? Well, if I cycle through them, you see that basically everything is upgraded a bit, so you get a bit better VRM cooling, you get some more power phases, you get somewhat stronger power phases. So that's something if you would do extreme overclocking, then it would make sense. If you're going to run it stuck, you will not notice any difference, of course. Um, it two, also... Two LAN ports. Yeah, it has two uh, LAN controllers on there. Um, it also comes with the M-Vision dashboard, for example, that the Ace doesn't. Um, so it's... Yeah, and it depends on if you want to use it or not. So, yeah. um, for some people would already, well, some people of course um, don't utilize all of this, and the Pro would already offer sufficient uh, connectivity or features. Um, but if you want to have basically all the features that we can offer, then the Godlike is the way to go. Um, also important to mention, both the Ace and the Godlike are extended ATX motherboards, so make sure your case can also support this. So the Pro and the Carbon are regular ATX motherboards, and the Ace and the Godlike are extended ATX, so they're quite a bit bigger. Uh, Nathan is asking, do both Ace and Godlike have RGB? Yes, both of them have it, yeah. uh, and also Carbon offers RGB. Pro is the only one that does. Ram is uh, asking, does the Mac Ace still have the debug LED? Yes, it does. Um, let me see. Merrick's asking if I plug in a six pin power connector for USB C, does the back USB support? No. No. The, the rear USB C port does not support power delivery. The six pin is specifically for the front USB Type C. So you can charge uh, a device from your front USB Type C on your case. If your case supports it, of course, that's an important thing. But it's specifically for the front IO. Then, what everything has, everyone has been asking for, the pricing. And just to make it clear, this is just a price indication, so this is not set in stone. And um, it's always at launch prices will be higher, eventually, usually they lower. 
And also important to mention, this is X670. Um, AMD already announced there will also be B650. Um, so you have to decide for yourself whether or not it will be worth it to go for X670 um, or if B650 is already enough for you. Um, so indication price in US dollar is uh, $329 for the Pro X670-P, 499 for the Carbon, 799 for the Ace, and 1299 for the Godlike. The price on the right, important to mention here, those are including VAT. And that's 395 for the Pro, 599 for the Carbon, 969 for the Ace, and 1599 for the Godlike. So yeah, prices are definitely higher than previous generation. As Martijn already man mentioned, they will still coexist as well, AM4 and AM5. Um, but definitely there are a lot of things that also cost a lot more money um, on uh, X670 compared to X570. So for example, the PCB is a lot higher quality. The VRM is a lot more extensive than X570. So you definitely see higher prices here. Um, that's something we, we will definitely not deny. Um, but also, if you're not utilizing all the I.O. Um, that X670 offers, then make sure uh, also to check out uh, B650 that is launching in October. Um, so we'll also have a live stream about that. We'll show you our different models. I cannot tell you the exact date yet. Um, but in October this year, AMD will also launch B650. So yeah, X670, I agree. Prices are, are relatively high compared to the previous generation has to do a lot with all the upgrades that had to be made. Uh, AD is asking what is two phase in 24 plus 2? So the two phases are for everything except the core, so also known as SOC or uncore, means everything that's inside the CPU that are not powering the cores. So that's where the two phases are for. Yeah. Sometimes you see 24 plus 1 plus 2, and then the one is for the graphics. For the godlike, there's no phases for the graphics. Nathan is asking, will these be available tomorrow? Yes. It's best to check with your uh, local reseller. Exactly. I'm not sure if any region will already have stock. Can be a small differences there. Also, uh, in terms of which boards they already have and which they don't. So best to ch check with your reseller for more detailed uh, information about this. But yes, um, they're launching tomorrow together with the AM5 CPUs. Peter is asking, will you have similar motherboards which supports Intel CPU? How do you mean exactly? We will not like have identical boards but with Intel uh, socket. Um, but yeah, for Intel we do, for example, have our uh, Z690 boards. Ray says, with all the materials that went into them, I was expecting them to be a bit pricey. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's definitely higher than what we're used to for motherboards and definitely for AM4. Because um, the requirements for AM5, they, they require quite a lot of high quality components. So mostly in the VRM, in the PCB, uh, the cooling as well. Um, so definitely a, a difference in price there. Um, but like Matthew mentioned, this will still coexist with AM4. So if you're looking for a more um, cost efficient system, you can still go for Ryzen 5000 series. Of course, DDR4 is also still a bit cheaper than DDR5. Because on top of this platform, you will still get DDR5. That's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, and even though price for DDR5 are coming down quite a bit, DDR4 is still the more affordable option. DDR4 and AM5 is not possible. So if you want to go for DDR4 system, you'll have to stick with AM4. Okay, Ruud. Maybe it's time to show what this combination can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go to the capture. Uh, I've prepared... Uh, uh, as he's, of, uh, sorry, an X670E Gold-like uh, with a 7950X. So I only have this CPU from AMD, so this is the only thing I know and uh, can comment on, uh, at least at first-hand uh, experience. Um, I did do some other testing with some cores disabled to simulate like a 7700X, but it's not the same since the boosting is quite different. Um, so this is the, the system we're using. We have a uh, RX 6950 XT Gaming X Trio and the X670E Godlike and the 7950X. Yeah, so they're uh, all quite small, but in the bottom you can also see um, the small visual that's cycling through all the, the different components that we're using. Yeah, and it uses 2 times 16 gigs of uh, DDR5 uh, 6000 memory. 
Uh, and at the moment it's running at uh, Castle HC 36. Um, I, I did, with this platform, if you install Windows 11 uh, cleanly, so clean installation, uh, it will automatically enable memory integrity. That's a Windows feature, a security feature. And uh, if you do that, then it will affect some of the, uh, the clock speed detection. So what I've, no what I've noticed is that uh, I was expecting uh, 3000 for the clock. So uh, if you look at that, it's with the DDR, uh, DDR speeds, like the 6000 uh, mega transfers per second. The actual clock is uh, 3000 uh, 3, megahertz. And when I had the memory integrity turned on, it was only saying 2758 or something. So a very weird number. Uh, also, the 100 megahertz uh, bus was saying like 96 or something. Um, so I figured it out. And when I disabled the memory integrity, everything was fine again. Uh, the same goes for the memory clocks. If you have some weird memory clocks going on in uh, HW Info 64, just disable the memory integrity uh, on Windows. It's uh, in the Windows settings and then go to security, Windows security, uh, device security, and then core isolation. And then it says memory integrity off in my system. If you have it to set to on, then the clocks won't be representing the real hardware clocks. Um, I also noticed that uh, AIDA, which I use for memory um, performance, uh, was also complaining about the part that the memory integrity part was on. So I switched it off and then everything was looking normal again. So at least uh, the same as our bias was showing the, the speeds. Um, so that, that's one thing uh, to consider. Um, for the rest, uh, I've have, I, I do have a, a Core Liquid S360, uh, so quite powerful uh, water cooling. It's an all-in-one water cooling. And that's actually what you're going to need for uh, a 7950X. So I know AMD is saying, OK, this is a 170 watt TDP part. Uh, if you look at the actual power consumption of this CPU, it's not 170, it's even more. Uh, and we can demonstrate that quite easily with our yeah, favorite uh, Cinebench 23 benchmark. And why is it favorite? Because it loads all the cores to the maximum. Uh, Ruud, and before you click start, I'm quickly going to interrupt you. Okay. Because I have our next winner. Okay. So if you haven't okay. participated yet, go to msr.com slash two slash insider. Or if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch, follow the direct link that our bot will put in the chat once every five minutes. Eric just confirmed that it should be doing it right now. Um, and our next winner for a game code for Assassin's Creed Valhalla and a DLC code for Don of Ragnarok is... Ruth, the honor is all yours again. Uh, Geek Padawan. Congratulations. You, are, you also won uh, a game code with the I code for I've DLC. I think I've seen that name before or not. Yeah, it's one of our regulars. Yeah, yeah. So Maybe you won before. So make sure also to uh, keep an eye on our mailbox, then we will email um, the code, so both for the game and the DLC to you in the coming uh, days. So if you haven't participated yet, make sure to do so. We will have more winners today. Back to okay. you. Yeah, maybe I should put the scaling to 150%. Is that better? Yeah, maybe that makes everything a bit bigger indeed. Okay, hang on. Oh, let's close this one, then it can rescale, hopefully. Uh, it's all a bit... 125, 150. Yeah, 150. Yeah, this should be better. Okay, this one. Sensors only. Yeah, the rest we don't need at the moment. Yeah, much uh, better. Okay. Now my scaling is a bit off. <laughs> I need to make it bigger. <laughs> If I had more time, I would have done that already. Um, let's go to the Cinebench part. Uh, let's make a graph out of the first one. And this is not enough. Uh, like AMD mentioned, Martijn mentioned that it's doing 5700 megahertz boost. And that's probably correct because in the maximum here, it says 5756. And, uh, 
that's probably with the single core loads. Uh, let me also get you the power. Uh, 300 watts is a bit much, but let's do that at 250. Then we should have the full range. And so this is the package power. This is specifically CPU package power. So this yep. is not measuring the full system. No, but we do CPU. also yeah. have a, a plug in between. So Ruud can later on also demonstrate some uh, yeah, total system. Yeah, we have a, wall, a power meter. So yeah. yeah. It, it only works if you compare with the same identical spec, so the same power supply, the same graphics card. But then again, uh, it, it, it's yeah, um, it, it gives you a good indication of what kind of power you should be able to expect. Um, let's run the multi-core uh, uh, benchmark first and see what it does to the frequency and to the temperatures and the power. Well, the power is interesting because we, yeah, in, uh, AMD is calling it a uh, 170 watt uh, CPU, TDP, but the actually power limit is set to 230 watts. So that's the uh, package power tracking or the PPT. Uh, with Intel, we would have called that the power limit, but yeah, it has a different name in AMD, but basically does the same thing, anything over that will be capped and uh, so the, the frequency it reaches is about well the lowest i can see here is a uh, 5080 megahertz so that's yeah that's a a big step up from uh, what we saw with the 5950x and but what we also see here is the thermal limit so even with this high-end uh, high uh, uh, water cooler, all-in-one wa water cooler. Yeah, so this in is a core liquid S360, yeah. so it's a big one. <laughs> yeah, and this is an open test bench, so it gets plenty of air because there's no restrictions with a case that doesn't have enough uh, uh, air going through it. Um, so this is basically too much power in a too small pa package, so it cannot be cooled better than this unless you go with a more extreme cooling. Uh, equipment. So uh, this is also the reason why uh, Precision Boost Overdrive cannot extract more uh, performance out of it because I cannot cool it better than this with a stock cooling. So that, that's basically what it does. Uh, Performance-wise, uh, because I have uh, HW Info running in the background, it does about 37.5k. Um, if uh, the background tasks were closed, it's doing uh, a little over 38k. UH60 driver is asking, running Windows 10 and not 11? I think you're running 11, right? Uh, this is Windows 11, yeah. yeah. I, I, I installed Windows 11 uh, 22H2. Uh, then I, uh, yesterday I read a lot of complaints, people asking, uh, uh, saying that there's some issue with uh, uh, graphics uh, and gaming. So I decided this morning to <laughs> reinstall it with uh, older Windows 11 21H1. So basically the vanilla Windows 11. So that, that's what I did. So yeah, th that, that's why I lost some time. I also had a cooling problem with a, a unit that was defective. So um, otherwise I would have had more time to prepare it even better than uh, we could today. Um, so if we're looking at the single thread, I'm not gonna run the whole benchmark, it takes too long, uh, but to give you an idea of the, the clocks it does, uh, let me reset that one. So it actually is doing the 5700 that Martijn was saying. So, uh, Social Gamer says, from the Gamers Nexus testing, the Ryzen uh, 7950X runs hot by design. They used 360 A AIO and it still ran hot. Yeah, we're yeah. also using a 360 AIO right now. And you can see indeed that we're still yeah. uh, on our full load, are reaching that thermal limit. Yeah, the, the, the 95 degrees, um, uh, we also do support for, uh, at least I do support for the, the, the notebooks as well. And for notebooks, it's not uncommon to see 95 degrees. Why? Because it's actually uh, uh, tuned, uh, the, the performance slash cooling, that, that's, a, that's a combined package. So it's actually tuned that it runs 95 watts and extracts the most power uh, performance out of it and just balances the power accordingly. So, so basically it always runs 95 yeah. degrees Celsius, but 
if and you see can. my uh, the, the stream we did with the uh, 12 uh, 900k s the s1 we already had the same problem so uh, uh, yes it, it did even more power than this amd does but um, depending on where the, the temperature sensors are inside the cpu and how much power you how much uh, temperature you're allowing uh, amd is allowing 95 and intel is allowing 100 so there's a little bit more room there uh, but i used the same cooler at that time and we had to undervolt uh, to make it not thermally throttle so that that's basically the same what's going on here uh, so uh, yes the performance is great and this will take a, a little bit too long uh, the, the single thread performance is about uh, i'm not sure it's uh, around 2100 so uh, going up from 1700 uh, for the 50 uh, 5950 so that that's that's an impressive uh, uplift in performance and the single thread power is not that high at all uh, as you can see here it's about 70 watts so that's totally acceptable and um, a lot less than the 230 watts uh, uh, we're doing when all all cores are loaded i see uh uh 60 drivers uh, cinebench was showing windows 10. yeah that's true uh, cinebench is uh um, cinebench is drunk <laughs> well probably it doesn't detect uh, uh windows 11 uh, by the build number so yeah uh, if you look at the, the, the version number, it's actually 10.0.22,000. Um, that's, uh, that's the build of Windows 11. Uh, it's a little bit different for the uh, 22H2. So uh, anyway, but that's just a cosmetic issue. It's not really a problem. I can show you it's a really, uh, it's uh, this version. It's not even, a, uh, fully updated or yeah, it is it is yeah now it's the win 10 win 10 that's a bit it's a 21 h2 yeah ah, yeah okay um chrome is saying i hope 7800x will be cooler uh 7700x yeah yeah there it's doing a lot less power uh, but 7600x, 7700x, then you get 7900x, yeah. 7950x. Uh, th they also talked about a 7800x 3D maybe, but that was rumor, so I'm not sure about that one. I uh, haven't seen it. I haven't seen any other CPU than the 7950 yet. Um, maybe so Martijn knows, but he probably won't tell anyone yet. <laughs> yeah, there was a question when Martijn was already logged off, uh, uh, saying uh, somebody's asking, uh, what about X3D? Uh, so the one with um, extra cash on it. Um, but yeah, there was no, uh, uh, he wasn't online anymore. Um, um, I also doubt if he would have answered it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the 7700X, so the Ryzen 7700X, 7, uh, that's a 105 watt TDP part, which basically is a 142 watt power limited part which is the same power limit as the 5950x so the previous flagship so not sure if it will reach the 142 watt uh, w with uh, just eight cores but if it does it probably is going to be a hot one as well because it only has one ccd and not two yeah, that's also something to keep in mind indeed yeah. because it's still like the chiplet architecture that amd uses yeah. so they for example, when you have a Ryzen 5 or a Ryzen 7, you will get a single chiplet with cores, so either 6 or 8, depending on if you're getting the Ryzen 5 or 7. Yeah. When you have a Ryzen 9, you will get two chiplets, two CCDs, basically, yeah. for the cores. Um, with, is it always, uh, for example, for the uh, 12 core, is it always 6-6? Six, six? Yeah. Okay. Should be. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, or j just guessing here. Yeah. And the 7900X, the one with, with uh, 12 cores or 2 times 6, uh, might be able to do precision boost overdrive a little bit more because I expect stock the power to be lower than this one. So there should be room to, to go up to the 230 watts. So maybe the, the precision boost overdrive will allow you to boost those 12 cores uh, a bit higher than the one the 16 yeah, then, then yeah. stock speeds so but 
there's no way for me to tell. And maybe even reviewers already uh, are showing the results today. But since I was busy doing this one, um, I wasn't able to read anything. So uh, I will do that tonight. Um, Memory-wise, um, uh, we can run benchmarks, of course. And the most uh, common one is, uh, I think, the AIDA64 one. Uh, Raxness is, say, is asking, in gaming, though, we should not see these temps, should we? No, like in, no, in general, no, no. it will use way fewer cores than, yeah. than you would. For example, Cinebench, you're completely loading all 16 cores on the CPU. Yeah, so you won't the power see, consumption no. will be way yeah. lower. You won't see 200 plus watts in, in gaming, yeah. but uh, there are more games that are uh, loading up the CPU uh, more than, than, than the older games, I would say. So. Uh, I've prepared the, the Formula One 2022, 20, and that one is already showing quite high uh, power consumption. And also, yeah, well, the temperatures are still within check because we're talking about, let's say, around 125 watts. But that's already pretty close to the maximum power that the 5950X was doing. So that was the 5950X was doing that in Cinebench, more or less. So but basically, it also means that the newer games are able to utilize modern CPUs better than the older ones. Yeah, they, they're also, w when they, they see they have uh, uh, CPUs that, that can do more, they probably also utilize them better. Yeah. yeah. And especially with the, the, the Formula One, uh, and we also saw it with the, the Cyberpunk one. The Cyberpunk is a bit weird because the settings don't always apply the same way so it's a bit weird to benchmark but so later we will also for example show the power consumption and the temperature while running f1 uh, yeah, yeah. 22 so you can see what kind yeah. of uh, also, load you can expect of course also depending on, on the on the resolution and the settings yeah. because if, the, if yeah, you put again. the stress on the gpu so being gpu bound then the cpu will drop a little bit so uh, if you go for the lowest settings, then it's more on the CPU side, so there will be the bottleneck. Yeah, um, so low resolutions, yeah. low settings will get higher yeah. power draw on your CPU. It sounds strange, I know, but that's the way yeah. it is, because you're you're moving the bottleneck basically. So uh, the memory is uh, uh, six thousand megatransfers per second. So the, the clock is uh, three. 1000 uh, megahertz um, and um, the, the, um, the memory controller um, clock I can show you with uh, CPU Z at the moment by default if you let the bias decide it's not running at 3000 but it's running at 1500 so at the moment it's running uh, a one to two uh, U clock to MEM clock ratio or divider, depending on how you look at it. Uh, basically, they're not running in sync. So that, that's what, what it shows here. So if we, uh, so the copy is about 69 uh, gigabytes per second and the latency is about 68. Let's make a screenshot, then, we, then I won't forget. Uh, there is a way to influence that, and I will show you in the bias. Uh, I need to un well, you do the detach magic. the display port. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise, it will only now. go th uh, go through the monitor. So yeah, I do have to do a quick trick here, to show it. Doesn't it. show the capture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're getting so into the capture. Yeah. So if you haven't participated yet in the giveaway, make sure to do so. Go to msr.com slash two slash insider, and maybe we can already draw another winner. If you're on Twitch or YouTube, you can also fo follow the direct link that the bot will put uh, in the chat once every five minutes. And our next winner, Ruth. Son of Gigaroth. Congratulations, you That's also a nice won name. a game code for yeah. Assassin's Creed Valhalla and the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC. I like the name. Yeah, it's a cool name. Cool name. <laughs> yeah, son of Gigaroth. Yeah, so for all winners, um, check your email in the coming days, and we'll send you both codes uh, with some instructions on how to read it. Yeah, so it's working. The BIOS. Okay. So uh, I can show you here the 
uh, if my uh, oh, my mouse is a bit laggy. So here we have. It's because it goes through the capture card now, so you don't have it directly. So this one should be selected. I'm not sure why. So if I hover over it, it's gone. That's a bug. See? Yeah. So there's two profiles mm. for Expo, and there's two profiles for uh, XMP, or in this case, AXMP. So this is because it's a combo kit. Like if you if you have like a dedicated XMP or a dedicated Expo kit, yeah. then you will not see this. So so basically, the, uh, uh, there's two profiles here. Uh, the, the first one for this uh, kit is a, a 6000 uh, C36, and uh, the, the second one is uh, a 5600 and C36. So since we're only running two modules, um, it's not a problem to run uh, 6000. Uh, um, the DRAM frequency is set by the Expo. Um, uh, the fabric clock, um, uh, th th there's also the, the infinity fabric uh, ratio. You can also uh, play with that, but there's only a little room uh, uh, to maximize the performance there. Uh, but this one um, is set to auto. At the moment, it's running uh, two to one. But we can force it to run at one to one, and then we will see uh, a slight, slightly lower latency. The, the bandwidth doesn't increase that much, at least not in the AIDA uh, memory benchmark, uh, but it, it does help uh, to improve the, uh, the latency a bit. So that, that's a free, yeah, free setting there. Um, I'm not sure why it, it's set to. Uh, uh, probably for safety reason is set to one to two, uh, but you can just change it yourself. And if it's not running stable, then you can always set it back. Uh, anything lower than six thousand should uh, set it to one to one. So if you have fifty six hundred or even in between uh, fifty six and six thousand, then that should uh, set it one to one. So six thousand and up will set it one to two. So a divider of two. I already saw a question about it earlier. How is the, the post time when changing memory settings? Uh, it's posting now. It's, it, it's, yeah, it's definitely not fast. Um, so the bias booting is slower than you would expect from an Intel platform. But with the, fr uh, I don't know if many people still remember the first uh, X370 biases they were pretty slow as well. So um, uh, we, 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 we talked to our bias team as well, and they said uh, th there's an upcoming change uh, from AMD, uh, and that will uh, improve it further, because I'm still running at a, a GISA 1.0.0.1 patch H, and the new one will be uh, 1003. So that will be uh, posting a bit faster. But I haven't seen. I uh, haven't tested that one uh, thoroughly yet, and I haven't compared the, 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 the boot time yet. So, um, um, the first time, if you clear CMOS, it will take a really long time. I think that's where Asorak was referring to uh, in their uh, media outings. And uh, after you've set the bias the uh, after the first time, then the booting is okay. It's not really. Uh, um, uh, tragically slow, but it's it's slower than expected. I would say, but not a not a big deal. But it is slower also if you compare it, for example, to AM4, right? Yeah. Uh, personally, I think AM4 was also not the fastest. No, so I agree. I agree. If you compare it to Intel, the Intel usually are faster, yeah. faster in booting. So, D not sure why that is, but yeah. Um, in the ASRock publication, they they also said it depended a lot on how much memory you inserted. So. Yeah, and the number of modules and that. the size of the modules. And the yeah, also, yeah. So let's check if the uh, memory clock uh, one to one ratio did anything. So let's run that benchmark again. Um. Radislav Rashev is asking, when do we test the Ryzen 7950X like APU in gaming? 
It's it's not really an APU like like the the G series we know from uh, from AMD. So also the integrated graphics here is not really meant to do any graphically demanding tasks. Um, so that's also why for these benchmarks we decided to use like a, a discrete graphics cards because we believe that that's also how the vast majority of people that will use these CPUs will also use it with. Yeah, so there today, was no choice on this motherboard, so. Yeah. yeah, on this motherboard there's there's not even a choice, but um, yeah, it's d don't expect like a, a crazy fast integrated graphics in uh, no. inside these CPUs. These these are still um, the CPUs that are not specifically designed for uh, for systems without a, a dedicated graphics card. That's what the G series are for. And I think if you're buying a Ryzen nine, then good chances that you will also buy a graphics card. Yeah. Of course, you don't have to. You can still use your system without one. But yeah, yeah. yeah. If you do CPU rendering, you don't need a yeah. graphic card. So the copy speed is not increased, still 69 something. So the latency was 68.3, if I recall correctly. And now it's 65.4, so that's a small decrease. Um, if I look at the, uh, these uh, DDR5 numbers and compare it to the Intel uh, Z690 platform, then, for example, the, the bandwidth, the copy bandwidth, and also the read and write are higher at the Intel platform, but the latency is pretty much the same. So um, not sure if, that, uh, if this benchmark is uh, treating Intel and AMD fairly, so not sure if that's really a big impact. We also used a 7-zip benchmark uh, before to demonstrate the difference between one memory speed and the other. And then um, yeah, AMD is much faster than the 12900K. But yeah, it's just a benchmark, you know. Mike Yell says, so past 6000 megahertz doesn't post. Uh, with four modules, no. In this testing, you were able to go up to 5600, 5, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe the, the I, I just chose the, the CL40 5600 because the, the, the slowest module I had was the CL40 module. So the other one was the, uh, the CL36 I am using now. So I had a mixed. A mixed uh, kit, so two kits. One was the Expo XMP kit, this one, the combo kit, uh, C36, and the other one was just a regular XMP kit with C40, so uh, 6000 C40. So the second profile is 5600 and uses the same cast latency. Uh, so the common uh, step down would be the 5600 C. 40. I haven't tried anything in between, so maybe 5800 will also work, but I have no clue. I didn't have time to, to test anything in between. So I don't know where the, the, yeah, where, where the stability or unstable uh, uh, border is lying, so where the tipping point would be. Um, Same question from Araxnas as well. Was the Infinity Fabric set to 3000 or left on auto? I read at one point just sticking it on auto was fine now. Uh, it's, it's set to auto and uh, uh, I can show you it uh, Ryzen Master. Uh, CPU Z is not showing me that and HW Info 64 is also not showing me that. So, uh, so it, it's still at uh, uh, default speed and the fabric clock, where are we here? So it's set to 2000. So now the U clock and the memory clock are in sync. So um, th that's what we said in the bias before. Um, and uh, not sure what the U clock mode means exactly. But uh, with this you can uh, set it uh, without any problems uh, uh, in, in sync in uh, 6000 uh, memory. But the fabric clock, I also raised it to 2166, that's the, the, the limit according to our in-house overclocker. And with, with, with this system, it just crashed. It, it didn't even boot, so uh, yeah. So I if it cannot reach that much more, then I don't think there's much to gain there. Uh, 
uh, and it, that might be this motherboard, this might be this memory kit, this might also be this CPU. Uh, if you have another CPU, might go higher. I don't so know. So still many variables that you have to take into account. Then. Yeah, I only have one of each, so I, I cannot really tell w w what the problem is or what the limitation is. So if the in-house overclocker says 2166 is probably the most you can get out of it, it's probably with more enhanced cooling and he probably knows what which voltages to raise to get it that, that way. And I don't know uh, that much about memory overclocking. Jet Norman is asking, how is the temps running under stress? Uh, we just ran uh, Cinebench, a full load for all 16 cores in this specific CPU that we're using. Yeah. And then it goes up to uh, 95 degrees Celsius with the current cell. So that's where the, the thermal limit is. Yeah. And it will cap it on 95 degrees Celsius. But it did reach 95 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, we can do precision boost overdrive. We can do it in a bias. We can also do it here. So just l let it uh, uh, have a socket power of 1000 watts and a thermal design current of 400 amps, which is a lot, and EDC go higher. This one you can even set, I don't know, 600, I don't care. The reason I cannot... I think 400 is the maximum. Oh, it's also <laughs> it fine. It jumps yeah. back. Okay, let's keep it that way. Uh, and see what the Cinebench score does. Well, let me also run this one. Just to give an idea of the clocks and power and temperatures. And especially the temperatures will be the limiting factor because the ceiling of 95 degrees centigrade is still the maximum I can do. So in the beginning the clocks will be a little bit higher so it's about 5.1 uh, gigahertz at the moment which is a bit higher or similar to the one we had so now it's finished and now it's 37.8 and before it was 37.5 or 6 I'm not sure again yeah um, I think around ha 37 and a half indeed so it, it, it's cooling limited and thermally limited so because it reaches the 95 um, degrees that's where there's no more room so yes with more advanced cooling methods you you might be able to get more out of the uh, um, the precision boost overclocking but not that much i tried it a little bit and even put like a push pull combination so uh, six fans in total uh, but it didn't get me much more performance so maybe we st should stick it right to the uh, to the air conditioning yeah the radiator yeah. right on top I, actually i ran a test uh, in my home and that was a little bit higher but that was because my room was a bit colder <laughs> <laughs> it was in the morning everything was really cool and cold so cold air coming in and then <laughs> it, it it boosts a little bit higher but it was already reaching the maximum uh, frequency so i don't expect much uh, to be gained here so overclocking wise this cpu isn't uh, giving you much and even with ln2 i doubt you can get really far with it so it looks like the ceiling is already reached um, i don't know if you know the, the cinebench score of 5950x uh, or 12900k but um, let's uh, do something differently instead of going overboard on the overclocking part let's go hey i cannot do less than this oh, then we have to go to the bias hang on <laughs> Yeah, Rise of Master only uh, you only get like rim, uh, limited ranges that you can yeah, set. Yeah, that's my oh, did I close? Oh. I'll unplug the <laughs> display port too soon. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't see what you were doing in him. Yeah, I well, see a question. It was still there, so I could. Yeah, <laughs> still I see a question it. from Plasima. Um, have you guys tried undervolting? People have seen some yeah. uh, gains in megahertz and drops in temps with minus 100 millivolts so far. Yeah, I got it. Uh, uh, minus 100 millivolts was not 100% stable. It did boot, uh, but I got it at minus uh, 75 millivolts. I also 
tried with the, uh, the curve optimizer part, which basically does the same uh, as undervolting, but then on, o over the whole range of the frequency and voltage range. Um, so it just lowers the, the curve. Uh, and the undervolting does basically the same. I'm not sure if that really 100% identical, but uh, the minus 75 megahertz did give me uh, uh, less temperature and higher uh, boosting clocks, which gave me uh, almost the same performance, or no, yeah, more or less the same performance with less power. And that's also what I'm trying to show you now. Uh, since we uh, uh, cannot go with the Ryzen Master to a low power limit of, um, of the PPT, so lower than 115 was not possible. Um, but if you have a 65 watt AMD part, the, the PPT limit or the power limit is set not to 65, but to 88. And there's uh, a calculation for that because they use the TDP times 1.35, and that's the PPT or the power limit uh, wattage. So let's save that and go to the windows and see what kind of Cinebench score we get. So the, the 5950X does about 25.5K and um, the, um, the 12900K does about 275 So remember that. Um, but the 12900K is doing about 241 watts at that time. <laughs> and see what this one does. I see Thor Blast is asking, will there be a mini ITX board with X670? To be really honest with you, I don't think that's a, a logical combination. Um, on mini ITX, you're, yeah. not, you're not able to utilize everything X670 has to offer. Um, so X670 gives you quite a lot of I.O. that you don't have space for on a mini ITX. So X670 would be unnecessarily expensive on uh, on mini ITX, in my opinion. Um, I cannot comment yet on what kind of mini ITX boards we will have in the in the future, but I think you can make a guess. And I think you can also guess then what, what's the board that I'm most excited about. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't think um, X670 and mini ITX are a logical combination. Um, we also haven't made one for X570. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that we won't launch uh, mini ITX boards at all. But you can see in which direction we're heading in with our thought process, I think. Uh, Steam is uh, acting up. Hang on. OK, so running multi-core benchmark again. We're going to look at the uh, package power. We've set it to 88. Uh, usually it does a little bit above that, so around 90, that would be the, the, the performance or the, the power draw. Uh, so it's completing the benchmark. So I, I think this is what, what Martijn was also talking about, the efficiency part. Uh, the score should be close to the 12900K, but instead of 240 watts, it drew 90 watts. So that's efficiency. And now, well, the fans are set to uh, automatic, so it, it, it just got about 50 degrees. But the clocks were also quite low. So for 37 or 3.7 gigahertz, the score is clock, high. It does quite high ah. performance. So if we go one step further, so not 65 watt TDP, but 105 watt TDP or 142 watts power limit, you get pretty close to already the performance numbers um, you're used to from uh, from this CPU. So I think we can use Ryzen Master now to change the. Eugene is asking YouTube chat which frequency is actually correct, Ryzen Master or Windows Task Manager? What sorry? This. Which frequency is actually correct, Ryzen Master or Windows Task Manager? I wouldn't trust uh, Windows Task Manager for clocks. Usually, uh, Windows um, is still in the single thread mode 
Uh, so they have they, they say yeah. there's one clock, but there's not one clock. There there's 16 clocks. That that, and probably Ryzen Master will be able to show you that with the monitoring part. I usually also go with HW Info. That one is yeah. accurate with clocks. The, the the problem with with Windows is that it shows. Uh, it looks like there's one clock for the CPU, but since there's multiple cores, you cannot do that anymore. Especially not with, with single threaded modes, you know. Because the clocks are all over the place. One is at 5.7 and the other one is at 3.2. So, which one's correct? Let's, show, let's see what Windows is doing. I cannot go to Task Manager. What's no, that's task bar, that's the wrong one. Okay, that's new. Did you break Windows? Yeah, or <laughs> maybe it's this keyboard, I don't know. Uh, task manager, here we go. So it says 5.3 gigahertz, something like that. Well, yeah, some cores are. So th this is not to be trusted. Uh, you, you cannot go one speed anymore. That's impossible. So don't don't look at that. Uh, uh, it's an indication, but no, nothing more than that. Yeah, here in HW Info, you see very accurately per core what it does at that specific moment. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do trust Ryzen Master since it's made from made by AMD, yeah. so uh, they they know what they what the clock should be. Um, yeah, but between and Ryzen Master and Windows Task Manager, indeed, go with Ryzen Master. Okay, let, let's do Precision Boost Overdrive and do very low PPT. Or let's set it to the same... Uh, can I not enter this? Is my keyboard running? Yeah, my keyboard uh, stopped working. Is your keyboard done? Yeah. Let me check if I can fix that for you. Uh, maybe it's just plugging in and plugging it out. Is it working again? Yeah, it's back. Yeah. Okay, that's why the maybe task the, the was USB not hub either. was struggling. Yeah. There is a USB hub in between. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we can just enter it, and then it stopped again. It stopped again. Maybe yeah. try plugging it into the system directly. Otherwise. Yeah, maybe that's better. Hang on. <coughs> but uh, which one is keyboard? One is his mouse, right? Just unplug it? Yeah, that oh, was the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. It's all live, you know. So we have ugly cables, but hopefully at least it works. 140. Okay. 142. No, it's not allowing me to enter it. That's weird, 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 weird. Reset profile. Is that possible? Or well, maybe it's messing up because I've set 88 in the bias and that's a value that the um, Ryzen Master does not accept. Okay, then we'll just go through. Um, this is a driver utility installer. You can also disable this part in the bias. I'll show you where. It's popping up too frequently, so not sure why that is. Tekken Player 88 is asking, is this a benchmark test? Yeah, we're actually doing several benchmark, also several settings right now. Uh, later uh, on, we'll also do a benchmark yeah. in gaming, so we will run um, F1 uh, 22. I, I'm trying to show you that uh, the, the power of 230 watts is almost uncoolable. Um, but there are ways to, to lower it, and 88 watts is probably not the best because uh, this CPU can do more uh, and give you more performance. Um, but 88 watts is basically the same power as you will, you, you will consume with a 5600X. So this will give you the same performance as a 12900K or even better than the 5950X with just 90 watts of power. So efficiency-wise, this CPU is amazing. <coughs> okay, let's go to the overdrive and let's set it to 142 watts, which is the exact same power limit as the 5950X. 
Yeah, I see some people in chat are also commenting that it says that the uh, PPT min and max are both showing zero, zero. I think it's because it's being overruled by the BIOS setting. Yeah, the BIOS is setting a value that the Ryzen master cannot do. So yeah. probably that's the reason why it was messing up. Uh, yeah, UH60 uh, uh, driver is also saying can, can change it because it's going by what you entered in the BIOS probably. Yeah, I think that's indeed what happens. Now what one person is asking, go 300 watts. Well, I'm not able to because it will limit at 95 degrees and that's around 235 watts. Yeah, so it will not it's go beyond it because you will more power it. now yeah. than in my office because in my office is warmer than here. Right now it is 21 no. degrees Celsius, no, just for reference. No, that's not correct. That, that's on your side of yeah, the Yeah, that's maybe, yeah, you're right <laughs> underneath the unit. I'm below the air yeah. <laughs> Usually I need to wear a coat when I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it gives the, the cooler the best chance of uh, reaching. Uh, uh, Jet is asking, is that an S360 cooler? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. So it is already a very high-end liquid cooler, but still, um, if you're if you're just um, letting it go, then it will reach 95 degrees. Yeah. If you don't limit it. Yeah. So so it, the 95 degrees. Uh, so this is a very powerful cooler. So if you have a cooler that's less, it will also show you 95 degrees. But Why? less because performance. That's, that's where it will thermally throttle itself. So th yeah. there will be a balance, and. Uh, it will just lower the frequency and the power so it will match the 95 degrees and it's sustainable. So you will get less performance. But what I've noticed, because I also did a test with the old uh, Wraith uh, Prism uh, uh, cooler, which is the box cooler that you will get with the 5600X or something. No, 5800X, no, I, I, I guess. Yeah, I think that one. And. Uh, that would keep the same CPU with no limits. It would just keep it at 95 degrees and it would lose about 5% of the performance. So the, the power consumption dropped a lot. Uh, I think it dropped to 180 or something. So that's 50 watts less. So it should be similar to what we're going to see now, but then with a better cooler. So if you want lower power consumption, just stick a cooler on that doesn't cool as well. Yeah, basically, <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, your performance will just be adjusted automatically for you. So yeah. uh, now we're reaching about 145 watts, uh, which is basically the power limit of the 5950X in stock speeds. And let's see what kind of performance we get. So 2550, 25.5 uh, thousand uh, points would be uh, 5950X. And this one reaches about 34 thousand points. So that's not that far off uh, uh, the maximum this one can do. So this one maxes out at 37, 38 because we have some uh, uh, logging in the b background. So you will lose about 10 percent uh, and this lowers the, the, the power consumption about uh, 85 to 90 watts. So that's not a, not a bit, that's a lot. So you're making it much more efficient. Yeah, more efficient in, in essence, yes. But uh, AMD has tuned it for performance, not for efficiency. Yeah. But this is something you can also easily adjust yourself if you want to. So yeah. for example, also if you want to yeah. stick this in a small form factor system, even when putting this, like we saw earlier, to yeah. 65 watts, you still get a lot of performance out of it. Yeah. Of course, not the maximum, but you can run this in a small form factor system because the efficiency is really good. You just have to, yeah, yeah. basically the, if, uh, you, if you lower the, the performance a little bit, you will get much more power efficiency for it. Let me show you another uh, setting, which is which might be easier because now we're just setting the power limits and it, it's trial and error. So do a benchmark and then go back to bias and, and change the power setting. There's a much easier setting I discovered. I have to go back to the bias again. So you're not going to set the power, you're just going to set this is the maximum temperature I want to see in the CPU. And that works with any cooler, also with the, the, the Wraith Prism I used. So then you're adjusting the 95 degree setting basically, for example, to 80 degrees or whatever. Yeah, just, just name, what temperature do you want to see? 85, 80? Yeah, let's maybe go like 
10 degrees Celsius lower to see what it what it does. 85? Yeah, 85 yeah, okay. sounds good. Let's do that. So I'm going to reset the, the, the power limits I did before. So if the power limits are set to auto, it, it means it goes <laughs> to 230 watts. Eric is in the chat and Eric says 83.47. <laughs> okay, Eric, I, I'm not sure if I can enter any digits, but <laughs> let's see. Okay, so first I'm going to uh, reset uh, the, the precision boost uh, thing. So let's go back to auto. So it just runs to 95 degrees normally. And this is the AMD overclocking uh, menu, but that's not even what you need. You can go to the AMD CBS part, go to thermal control, set it to manual and say, I want a TJ Maxx off, what was it? 83.47. <laughs> no, you cannot do any digits. I'm not sure if that's correct, but we can do 83. Close enough? Yeah, close yeah, enough. Okay. Or 84. <laughs> anyway, let's do 83. Point 0.47, so you it, would go with 83 then. <laughs> just to give you an idea what you can do with this setting, right? So, so this is a difference yeah. of 12 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so if you are uncomfortable with seeing 95 degrees uh, um, uh, in your CPU all the time, uh, when you're doing uh, multi-core loads or uh, maximum loads, I, I could say, um, then you could just set this setting to whatever temperature you like and see this should be the maximum and don't go any higher than that. So with this cooler, this CPU cooler can do quite a bit. Eh? So with 83 watts, it cannot do 235 watts like we saw before. But now we're going to see how much it can uh, dissipate. Oh, hang on, I need to connect the display port again. <coughs> I see Bush Nachman is asking, so the live stream will be on Mondays instead of Wednesday? No. Um, actually, we will also have a live stream this Wednesday. We just have an additional one now because of the, um, the AMD Ryzen 7000 series. They will launch tomorrow. Um, and right now, we were able to show you performance to show you some live benchmarking. So earlier in the stream, we had uh, Matthijn from AMD also telling about the new platform, the, the different uh, CPUs that will be available. So that's why we have an additional live stream uh, today. But we also have a live stream this Wednesday on, on our regular time. Oh, one advantage is with the power setting, and at least if you don't go too low, uh, and with the temperature setting is that the, the, the single thread uh, uh, clocks and performance will still be identical as long as you're lower than the, the 70 watts or higher than the 70 watts that the single thread uh, uh, a performance needs. So let's see what this cooler can do to keep it at 83. And the, the room temperature is probably about 90 degrees, uh, 19, not 90. So it seems to be settling at 210 watts, give or take. And the clocks are only slightly lower. And I see the steady line for the temperature now. Yeah. And it's maxing out basically. Yeah, the, the, the temperature is 83.3. So that, that's pretty, uh, pretty close to what Eric uh, wanted. <laughs> and then this is the performance. Actually, it didn't lose anything. With this cooler, you didn't lose anything. It's like, like less than 200 points difference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is within margin of error. So yeah. if you put the, the, the uh, uh, worst cooler on it, like the, 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 the Wraith Prism, for example, uh, you would lose about 10%. So you will go, uh, it will drop to roughly, uh, yeah, that was in a case, so that was about 150 watts. So very close to the performance we got with the 142 uh, power limit we set uh, uh, a few minutes ago. So th that's the performance you, you, you're actually getting with different kind of cooling solutions. And you can set this temperature to any cooler and then it's set and forget, and it will just automatically maxes out uh, what your cooler can do or your cooler inside your case can do. Because if you have a case that's not uh, good on airflow, it will also limit the performance. But it won't overheat, at least. So let's set it back to default and then do some gaming. And 
Let me show you because I forgot where to disable the driver and utility installer. Uh, Jed is asking, are the fans maxed out on the radiator too or just auto? No, they These are, are auto. just auto. They, they are connected to the CPU fan header on the motherboard, so they are controlled by the MSI uh, BIOS. And it's set to default, so it, it, it uses the curve that, yep. that's default. I, I haven't set it. It will spin up automatically yeah. when the temperature rises. Normally, the, the fans are attached to the controller inside the S360. Uh, and normally, you would control that with MSI Center. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's already uh, finished uh, for Godlike. So let, let's first try without the MSI Center. <laughs> Let me see if we have... That's going to be doing our giveaway in the meanwhile. So if okay. you haven't participated yet, go to msi.com slash 2 slash insider. Or if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch, you can also follow the direct link that our bot will put in the chat once every five minutes. Oh, this is a difficult one. This is definitely for you, Ruud. Uh, our next winner. <laughs> uh, iPhone H2. So Y P H A N H two. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Python, what? Yeah, hard. To, yeah, not sure. We are probably butchering your name, but congratulations! You also won a game code yeah, for yeah. Assassin's Creed Valhalla with Sorry a code I for Dawn of Ragnarok. Sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly. The DLC. And then let's head back to yep. BIOS. So uh, let's remove the thermal thing. Uh, now we can see, oh, that's the wrong wrong menu. Let's go back to auto. Jet says, just uh, pre-planning ways of getting away from the scary 95 degrees Celsius. So yeah, that's actually very easy. You can, you can just set the thermal limit yourself yeah. to whatever you prefer. And as you can see, you, can, you don't lose that much performance, for example, when already taking it 12 degrees Celsius down, what we previously did. Um, but you also, you can lower this even further. And I would say that you will uh, reach even higher efficiency numbers. Of course, you will lose a little bit of performance. Yeah. Um, but what you get back in terms of efficiency, uh, especially if you're building, for example, with a more limited cooler or small form factor or anything like that, you will get a lot of efficiency back for it. So it can definitely be worth it. Yeah, if you're annoyed by the driver and utility installer pop-up, uh, you can disable it here. It's in the settings and advanced menu. Um, and of course, there's an easy mode and an advanced mode. You have to go to the advanced mode, then to settings, then advanced, and then here it is. Um, for completeness, I'm going to click on the hardware monitor, and you will see the CPU. The three fans are connected to the, uh, the CPU fan header on the motherboard. If the fans are spinning very slowly, then the detection isn't always correct. So at the moment, it's running about 700 RPM or something. And yeah, it, it goes maximum at around uh, 80, 80 degrees. So if the CPU reaches 80, then it should run at 100% uh, fan speed. OK. Uh, Port so 81 is asking, why is AM5 so toasty? It's, it's just the default. The default setting is pretty maxed out. I think that's, that's yeah. basically it. So the, the CPU can be very efficient. But by default, yeah. it just runs up to 95 degrees Celsius, basically. It, uh, it allows 235 watts, and that, yeah. that makes it quite hot uh, because there's a lot of power in a very small package, package. Yeah. and underneath that metal uh, heat spreader there's there's only like very tiny uh, squares with, with a lot of heat uh, being uh, produced and it's hard to remove that heat uh, fast enough so that's basically why it's so hot. Port 81 says so it needs to be on, under volted. It doesn't have to, you can run no, it but at you, 95 you definitely degrees. can. And, yeah. uh, uh, I, I think that, that there's a lot to be gained with undervolting, much more than there is to be gained with uh, overclocking. Yeah. But it is it, it is the default setting from AMD, basically. So yeah. that at least 
Yeah. According to AMD, it is a safe setting to run on their CPUs. Yeah, and undervolting means just that AMD has set a very safe and quite high voltage. Uh, so every CPU, every 7950X uh, coming from uh, the factory is able to run stable at that uh, setting. And even with, with boards that are less high end than this one, so if the voltage controller is a little bit uh, um, more uh, alternating the voltage a little bit, then it still runs fine. So it, the better the, the VRM is, the better chance you will have uh, that undervolting will be successful. So the, the more stable the VRM is. Yeah. Okay, so what did we set? Actually, we, we set it back to stock speeds now and we only disabled the driver uh, uh, utility installer. So let's do some gaming, I think. Yeah, let's see some gaming. Uh, well, Formula One 22 uh, is actually uh, also quite CPU heavy, I would say. I'm gonna yeah, it utilizes more of the CPU than most games, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And depending on the setting, of course, the, the more uh, graphically intense setting you're going to use, the less requirements for the CPU, so the CPU power and the CPU utilization will drop, but not by that much. So uh, some games, they don't utilize the CPU at all or almost uh, no power draw. And we'll, we'll with sometimes you, you see CPU power around 40 watts. That's not going to be the case with this one. I've loaded up the uh, on-screen display from uh, Riva Tuno. That's the one I, I modified myself. Uh, uh, people who watched this uh, live stream before when I was joining probably have seen it before. And it, it's showing the basic uh, stats like the, the, the GPU clocks, uh, the GPU uh, uh, power consumption, the temperature, the CPU clocks, the CPU temperature, and the CPU power. Can you make uh, it one setting bigger? Uh, yeah, we can. That's or the other way around. Sorry. Yeah, that's better. No, cannot go better bigger than this. No, this is okay. This is easier um, to read. <coughs> what we see here is the GPU is already being utilized quite a bit with 332 watts. But the same with the CPU, AMD does also with the GPU power. And apparently this power setting in software isn't correct. So um, we have to take that with a grain of salt. It's probably more in the 410 to 420 watt range if you see 332. So with, with, with the TDP on the CPU side, they had an exact number like 1.35. Something similar is happening with the GPU, but not 100% sure about the uh, 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 multiplier or divider on that one. Um, so I've set basically ultra high settings and disabled the ray tracing part. And uh, let's see what it does if we run a benchmark. Uh, actually, I should have set Singapore, right? Because that's the upcoming race. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. this Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what the CPU power is going to do. So it's basically already up to 110 watts. Verstappen is starting behind Latifi. What? Interesting one. Great penalty. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a, a, a case of the. Uh, a game that, that's utilizing the CPU more intensively than most other games. So, I think so in most games, you're likely to see a lower power yeah. draw from the CPU. And also, if you set the, the, the settings higher. I think it's already in higher settings than before. Wait. I think it's running at 1440p now. Hang on. Let, let's change that. I think the, the power can go even higher on the CPU side. The GPU yeah, side will still be the same. If you put it to 1080p, so lower resolution, so gives it, you a higher oh, it's FPS and more K resolution. Yeah. Oh, it's 4K resolution. Even. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can draw more than 110 watts. I think we can. 
1080p, that should be possible. Yeah. See if capture still works. Yeah, coming back, okay. Oh, uh, now we have to re readjust <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> now it's a bit big. This? Yeah, that works. One bigger? No, I think this works. Now we can still see what we need to see. Okay. And also see the clocks of the CPU is around yeah. 54, 5.4, 5.5 gigahertz, I would say. So clock speeds have increased uh, quite a bit. That's and now we're starting at 125, yeah. 126 watts. And let's see what's on the, yeah, it's about 660 watts on the wall. So probably around 400 watts going into the GPU and 125 watts in the CPU. And the rest is motherboard and power and uh, SSD stuff, LEDs going on. So let me see, the temperature is now at uh, 56 degrees Celsius. So yeah, you can also see yeah. in gaming the temperature is a lot lower than when yeah. you're, for example, running. And the fan speeds 64. are lower now because yeah. it's still set to auto. It's not maxing out, so, yeah. So at gaming, this, the stock settings will not cause any difference or uh, any, any problems. Now we also did some testing. Uh, with, with the other graphics card, but with this graphics card and Cyberpunk, uh, we saw that this CPU was doing better than the 12900KS, so um, with, with this graphics card, so. And by a few percent, I think it was about 5% faster in uh, 1080p ultra settings, so without ray tracing and um, FSR or DLSS. Wardog's asking which CPU color is on the 7950X. This is the Core Liquid S360. So it yeah. is quite a, a big, beefy cooler. Yeah. It's a 360 millimeter radiator. And then you get about uh, 322 FPS. Only costs you 660 watts and, yeah, uh, a heavy electric bill. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else we want to see? Yeah, if you have any requests, drop them in chat right now. Then we can still run one last demo before we close it off for today. Um, yeah, indeed, UH60 driver. The CPUs indeed don't come with the cooler out of the box. So all of the, the new no. Ryzen 7000 series it's just a CPU in the box, no cooler. Do 720p low settings, yeah, sure. Okay. We can do that. 720p low it is. Uh, it should boost the uh, FPS quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, graphic setting. And let's video, see what the power no. consumption does on the CPU, I'm curious. I th I'm not sure, I haven't tried it, so. We're gonna just... Londog is asking, um, you guys okay? kind of lost yeah. me with the last change. It went from 4K resolution to 1080 and the wattage of the processor went up. Is that what I saw? Can you br briefly explain why? Yeah. yeah, actually it is, if you make it more CPU bound uh, instead of GPU bound, and you do that, for example, by lowering settings or resolution, you basically mm -hmm. make the game lighter <laughs> for the GPU, allowing your okay. system to run more FPS and a higher FPS means more load on your CPU. So actually the lower settings oh, you wait. use and the lower resolution you use, the more lo strain you will move from your GPU away to your CPU. So if you, if you for example, play very heavy AAA titles in 4K resolution, you will barely load your CPU because you will always be limited on your GPU. So actually, if you're, if you're doing a lot of AAA title gaming on 4K resolution, you will barely notice any difference, if any, between like a Ryzen 5 and a Ryzen 9. Um, if you're 
on the other hand, making something very CPU bound, that's where CPUs can really make a difference. So if you're playing a lot of esports titles, low settings, low resolution, um, you will be way more CPU bound rather than GPU bound. Okay, so settings are all set to low and the resolution is 1280 uh, by 720. Oh, let's do the benchmark. So probably CPU power is going to increase and GPU power is going to drop. Uh, somebody's asking port 81, what is the recommended power supply? That's a bit hard to answer depending mostly on the combination of your CPU and GPU. So yeah. for, for the 7950X, uh, consider 230 watts. Uh, uh, that should be uh, the target for the CPU. I can then quickly show you the slide from AMD that Montaigne presented before uh, with some suggestions. So here you, for example, see the combination of a Ryzen 5 and a um, 6750 XT. We're talking about 650 watts. Ryzen 7 with uh, 6800 XT, 750 watts. And a basically the system we're using right now, so Ryzen 9. 7950X with uh, the RX uh, 6950 XT, 850 watts. But it also very much depends on the settings you're, you're using. Yeah. But it's just an, an indication that uh, Matein from AMD gave with regards to, to some different configurations uh, you could be looking at. Yeah, I don't expect this uh, configuration to do over 80, 850 watts. So. Um, no. How much are we pulling now from the wall? Uh, from the wall, not that much, I think. Uh, well, not what's well, not much. Uh, 400 watts. 400 watts. Yeah. Because now, of course, the power consumption of the GPU is very low, because yeah. the settings are so low and the resolution is yeah. so low. Actually, the CPU is drawing more power now than the GPU, which is no, interesting. The G GPU, the watts reported in software are not. It's not correct, very accurate. So is it? Yeah. They're probably higher than that. No. Yeah. Not but by much, though, if we're totaling 400 watts. Can't be that mm. high. I, I would say it's, it's yeah, 1.2, 1.3 times what it says here. Yeah. So right now CPU is doing 125 watts, 126. Yeah, it's very much similar to the other setting, the 1080p uh, ultra setting. So CPU wise, it wasn't that much different. Uh, but you did see that the 6950XT uh, graphics card was only doing around 60% utilization, so there was a lot more room to to expand. The average frame rate is uh, 439. So, okay. So that was our last benchmark for today. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't have time to do any more, but I'm sure in the, in the future we will have more live streams and we will dive deeper also into specific topics. Um, I already saw someone talking a bit about uh, undervolting earlier. That's something that's still on our agenda to, to dive deeper into. I think uh, undervolting is, is not only limited to AMD, so... Yeah, we can do like a broader yeah, undervolting, yeah. also uh, GPU included. But I'm in definitely interested in, in the yeah. undervolting part, and I, I think there's mu much more to gain there than there is in overclocking at the moment with current CPUs, and maybe even GPUs. Um, However, well, with GPUs undervolting, I, I didn't have that much success yet, so... So before we close it off, uh, let's quickly take a look at our streaming schedule for the coming weeks. So um, as I mentioned before, this uh, week we will have two live streams. So apart from this one, we still have a live stream in our regular slot on Wednesday. Um, so that's 4 o'clock CEST. Um, then uh, we will cover uh, the Intel Innovation event. I believe it starts tomorrow. Um, so we'll talk about all the, the cool stuff that Intel uh, will be announcing during their innovation event. So make sure to, to tune in this, this Wednesday. Um, then um, the week after, so Wednesday the 12th of October, um, uh, NVIDIA is of course launching our RTX 4090. Uh, so then we'll talk about that one. Um, um, on, let me see, oh sorry, that was two weeks further already because we have one in between, the 5th of October. But we cannot tell you too much about that yet. And the same goes for 
the 20th of October, and that's on a Thursday, so keep that in mind. That's one day later than, uh, than usual. Um, and that one we can also not talk about. And then we have Wednesday the 26th of October, and that there we simply don't know yet what we're going to do. So for the coming weeks, we already know what we're going to do, but two of them we cannot mention yet. But this Wednesday, we're going to talk about Intel Innovation event. So make sure to tune in. Um, let's maybe do one more giveaway before we close it off. So I hope you all participated. If you didn't yet, you're too late. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, on Wednesday we will have another uh, giveaway during the live stream, so make sure to tune in then. Rut, the honor is all yours. Okay, Iram, you Iram, won. congratulations, you're the last winner for today. So to all the winners, congrats, keep an eye on your mailbox, there we will email the game codes uh, of Assassin's Creed Valhalla and the DLC codes for Dawn of Ragnarok. Um, with some instructions on how to redeem it. So thanks everyone for joining today. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope it was interesting and um, hope to see you all again this Wednesday. Okay. Ruth, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. And uh, see you guys all next time. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.